from the past, but I just met him a couple of weeks ago. Um, did you talk about the moon? Yes. That's his, his thing at yes. the moon, yeah. Yeah, he just, he did a talk at a star party, a weekend star party over there um, with Dawn and- uh, oh, 12 uh, here. His and talk was called Postcards from the Moon, so it's not to be- 12 and 12, 24. And Dawn actually heard the talk, I didn't, I don't know what I was it's, it's a lovely new talk, it, it does focus more on sort of the deeper dive into his 365 days of the moon. Yes. Um, oh, joy so much. And, cool. um, and of course, the next one will be um, yes. Tom uh, Wilson. I don't know. No, on Zoom. 12 on Zoom. His name written. But anyway, 12 on Zoom plus how many you got here? Um, the gentleman from SETI in California, he's going to be speaking to us also from Zoom. So hopefully, we'll have some more people. Maybe, maybe we'll have to um, have snacks here or pizza or something to. To entice people to come to the meeting. Door prizes. But then, door door prizes. Prizes. Ooh, ooh, I like that. That's awesome. Um, and so it, it's good. He's going to talk about, um, uh, you know, what set the just basically generally, I don't have a title yet for his talk, but it's going to be about what the SETI work. And also, he is working part time over at Unistellar and, um, you know, with the new telescope. So that should be interesting. And uh, then we have plans for our holiday party in December, um, and ideally at the clubhouse with the Gem and Mineral Society. And um, we have an, I, I sent an email out to their official address and have to come back and they're gonna do, Greg's gonna um, follow up to this next meeting. Uh, yeah, one of I'll, be a, I'll probably show up there next, next board meeting. Oh, nice, okay, perfect. So um, that is it. Um, I'm going to put up the treasures report that was in um, the newsletter that just came out. It's uh, Sean saying he's titling in August because I think he must be out of town. I haven't heard from him. And so he's saying August because these were all expenses in the month of August. And, uh, you can see that's nothing unusual. Uh, we, have, we have money, we have expenses, and uh, if there are any questions, I'll try to answer them. We're in the black, right? I'm sorry? We're in the black. We are in the black, yes, yes. Um, At least not, not as much in the black as we used to be, which is why we're doing a survey, which I'll get to in a minute. But we're trending higher, we're trending more black or more and more red. Over um, the last few years, we've been our balance has been going down. Right, but we bought a container. We did all. Yeah, the right. Exactly. We've got a lot of one-time expenses. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, unless we find a new project, those ex I mean, those expenses may be over. Somebody asked me today about next year's budget. So I don't know. We should be uh, trending down on on expenses at Bad Wolf and Pedernales Falls, but. You may come up with a new project. Uh, and we're talking about doing something to Ink Slate. Yeah, right. whoever asks about the next observatory gets to build it. <laughs> <laughs> you ask about it, you get to build it. <laughs> okay, so if you want to look at this more carefully, it is in the newsletter that came out yesterday. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, we don't have a lot of chairs here. Greg is here, equipment chair. <laughs> Hey, uh, let's see. Uh, we've got another uh, another short work project coming out tomorrow uh, down at uh, Kim Warren's uh, place to see how much more of the uh, the twelve foot building that we can take down. Um, uh, let's see. We picked up. <laughs> Uh, um, <laughs> this is really one was a uh, one's about a, one's a, I think a seven and a half inch uh, Takahashi uh, uh, SAT uh, with a really nice uh, go through package on it. Uh, the other one is a 10 inch Alex 200 with a own power board. Uh, so, um, but I've talked to Domingo and we actually have an extra power board. So we, uh, we should be able to uh, hopefully get that one fixed and, and get in get in operation as well. Um, 
That's about it for equipment for this month, I think. Okay. Any questions for Greg? Thank you. Uh, communications, Terry. <laughs> So, uh, main thing going on with communications right now is we were working to convert our uh, web hosting, well, our, our person management system, uh, sort of the backbone of uh, uh, everything we do to manage the membership uh, over to a new system. You guys have probably heard of us talk about Wild Apricot. It's costing us uh, $2,500 a year. We're going to move it to a better product called. Uh, Little Green Light, which would be about $45 a month. So uh, maybe 500 or something a year. Uh, so as I said, it's a work in progress. I'm hoping to get a, a prototype mocked up by probably mid-October. And we'll get some folks to look at that. Uh, uh, we we want to make sure that it does everything we need to do in terms of managing members. So we have, uh, you know, Family memberships, different membership levels. We're talking about doing some other things, uh, uh, membership wise. You know, we need to make sure that, that all works. But uh, uh, we can get it checked out in the November, October, November timeframe. We can convert over in December when well, our wallet and it comes out. And that's the main thing going on with communications. Any questions? If you need a beta tester, I like trying to break software. Uh, you got it. <laughs> you asked for it. <laughs> okay, um, Chris Bernhardt, um, member services is not here because uh, he's in Disneyland, lucky. Disney, Disney World, one or the other. Lucky. I'm sorry, what? I said lucky. Like, yeah, <laughs> his family is one of the Disney places. So uh, I'll report what I know, which is I believe that there's a member star party at Bad Wolf. Two weeks from tomorrow. Does anybody think? I think that's right. You'll be getting an email. Um, it's roughly what the moon would say. I'm sorry. It's roughly what the moon would say. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. There's a full moon live tomorrow night, so I think that's right. Uh, two weeks from now, and I think it is back at Bad Wolf. There's some plan for having all those falls later in the year, but I think this it, this month it's Bad Wolf. And then um, that's pretty much all I know as far as member services. Um, question. Yeah, do you have any uh, Austin Star party out at the out at St. Stephen's? We will not have one this fall. The school is not allowing us to come. They're still uh, have some protocol COVID protocols, and they have said that we cannot come this fall. So I'll go there by next year. Um, and then Ed LaBelle, who I think I uh, don't think is, is on Zoom, uh, he usually has a, a Psalm 19 uh, activity on the second Friday of the month for this month and next month. And I think he said he's going to be, because the moon is going to be, the face of the moon is going to be changing. He'll be able to start coming to meetings in November, I believe he said. Anyway, I know that a week from tomorrow is a public star party at Pernalis Fall. And then around the 20, there's something on the 29th at Twin Oaks Library. There's a couple of things on October the 1st. There's a, a star party at East Lake. And then there's also uh, an event at the for the Kyle Library. So <clears throat> I'm sure he will be sending things out to people with details of that. But um, uh, that's that's what I know at this point. Don? Um, there's also two other events uh, that he's actually going to be helping me out with. So in lieu of an astronomy or also under the stars on 22nd, for any of you interested, there is a star party that is a partnership between Stone Ledge Winery and the Las Passas County Friends of the Night Sky that's going to be out in Lomita on the same day on the 22nd. Um, and that is at the very least a delicious, if not two delicious <laughs> glasses of wine. Um, <laughs> phenomenal winery, uh, but yeah, a large, uh, large gathering. We figured out what's, what's more important to me than the stars. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I am looking right at you, but yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, and I'll have that information going out. And also as a, an advance, um, we have been invited, an uh, invitation has been extended to this club and, and several others. The Centennial for Texas Parks and Wildlife is next year. Oh, cool. And we've been invited to participate in a centennial event at Devil's River State Natural Area, Ooh. which several of us went to last year. Um, 
So if you want a Mercadon or Calendar, that's about a four and a half hour drive. I have it on um, And what date? That's, so the, the first date is set for March 18th with a backup weather date of April 15th. Um, we will be looking for no more than 10 astronomers because they are, I mean, if you want to come and don't mind camping, that's one thing, but the first 10 astronomers at RSVP get preferential treatment stay in the bunkhouse, Ooh. which is air conditioned. It gets cold out there. And also I have a heater too. Yeah, this is March, so it's a bit chilly out there. Can I sign up now? I know. <laughs> I, I think just kind of always. Yeah. <laughs> Me and Don have been talking. Um, nice. But yeah, so we'll have, have more information about that. I do know that Pedernales Falls is participating in the centennial also, mm -hmm. and they have, when we were setting the schedule for 2023, there was a specific date that Stephen Garman wanted for uh, the, their celebrate their, their centennial celebration, and we, we did work the calendar around, so this, we can do that there, I think it's uh, April, and it doesn't, it doesn't even it doesn't conflict with what you're saying, does. so yeah. So uh, we'll we'll be hearing more about that, obviously. Yeah, and I think do you know? You, know, you probably don't. But there, I saw something somewhere. No, I did see. I it was on the Hill Country uh, in the newsletter. I think about Lost Creek on the yes uh, October. Yes, uh, that that is on the. Yes, yeah, so yeah. they'll so we're going to be doing a star party at it's Boulder Creek at the Boulder Creek Trailhead. In the Lost Creek neighborhood, which is off of 360, and that's part of the Country Night Sky Month that I'll talk about momentarily. Okay. Okay. I know that Lost Creek has been talking to, I remember getting emails mm -hmm. from them, and it never worked out, and then we had the pandemic, so I'm glad we're finally going to get mm -hmm. to Lost Creek. Uh, not part of that, which is nice. Um, okay, members of large, we've got a couple members of large, or one this coming. Yeah, you have anything? Yeah. It actually does. <laughs> you'll, you'll talk a little more about fundraising later. Um, but on that topic, um, today I just kind of got thinking about um, through my company, uh, I was looking through our, our corporate giving page uh, to see if they did you know matching donations. And you can they had a, a database of charities. So I searched for astronomy. There were actually a couple of astronomy clubs in Texas that popped up. Ours was not one. So I know, uh, there's a way to submit an organization. So I need to get our tax number. Okay. I want to submit the organization, try to get into the database, uh, and then see if I can, you know, if I do donations, then do a company match, and then, uh, you know, reach out to the coworkers and stuff. Yeah, I, I talk to people at work all the time about, you know, telescopes, and I mentioned I'm in the club, and, you know, people are interested in it. So, uh, you know, reach out to people and we can get some company matching. Um, I think that'd be one way to, to help bring in some donations. And I uh, encourage anybody, you know, if, if you're uh, currently employed and your company does any kind of matching, you know, let's look into whether or not um, they do the matching for all of the We are a 501c3, right? So, yes. right. Yeah. And my husband Jim's company, AMD, will uh, provide money too for in you know. volunteer work. If anybody else here uh, works at AMD or if you have friends who do, AMD will pay you or will, will pay the club 25 bucks an hour for your volunteer time. So not really wow. matching, but still giving mm -hmm. money. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It, it's something something they used to do um, back when I first joined, and they had financial problems, which they don't have anymore. So they're they're back to doing it. They are actually they're they're saying if it means enough to you that you are going to volunteer your time, we we're gonna we're gonna chip in some money. Cool. Yeah, so we we probably need to start publicizing to our members about. <laughs> Check their different uh, programs like this for people to check into their employers and see if there might be anything that would help us out. Are we still set up with the Amazon Smile? As a matter of fact, I was just <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, I was just going to say I noticed in the the, the last treasury report it says uh, sixteen dollars and eighty four cents from Amazon Smile. <laughs> so. 
Not a lot, but yeah. every bit hurt helps. Yeah. Well, we, could, we should definitely put that in in uh, the city every issue yeah, of the city of times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big headline, right? <laughs> put you know, put it as your homepage on Amazon every time you buy something. We should we should reach out to the club and be like, okay, who, who can show what they purchased has gone towards Amazon <laughs> Smiles so we can start well, we buying them online? Like, it's more just a one click thing that automatically enables smile for people and say, send this out to oh. everybody and say, hey, click on this, yeah. enables so it. That's the way to donate it. Buy on Amazon. You have a delivery a day, then yeah, yeah. 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 yeah mine shows me out of head. And I don't know what period of time, 38 donations. I don't, I don't buy a whole lot from Amazon. Maybe we ought to have a competition to see which member can bring in the most smile money. Yeah. And you well, we got to learn what products are accepted. Because yeah, if it were all everything. products, I, my household alone would have funded the club. Entire club pandemic. Andrew, you're going to ask. I say I do subscriptions to multiple things, and you know they give you a discount already on subscriptions. So mm -hmm. would those apply to Smile? You think, or would you just describe? Yeah. Yeah. I think it usually that comes that up when you purchase. So yeah, it tells you whether it qualifies or not. Yeah. 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 I was saying that this qualifies, yeah. yeah. Anyway, some more publicity on that. Yeah. Terry, I was just thinking maybe uh, with Little Green Light, with the member management, like if there's a, you know, like have a constant contact and those things yeah. send out, like if we can put in all of those you know, activities, those kind of it will help, uh, like, well, it'll help track, yeah, and, and uh, facilitate it. Yeah, Little Green Light will definitely help in that area. Great idea. I know some orgs do like uh, engraved okay, paving stones uh, and things like that. Have we considered looking at that? Nathan, you want to say anything about the new one? We like the new one. I got it done on time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you saw it or not, if you're on, on signal or not, but not too long after it oh, came yeah. out, yeah. Uh, AS, and I think that's the car, Sam uh, said, uh, well, there's a nice image of this month's news. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, Okay, I think Jake, you're online. Do you have anything to say? Um, I well, I guess we did set up a, a Discord yeah, server yeah, last yeah, week. Yeah. If anybody oh, wants, sorry, he's to. actually talking. Right he's uh, now. You're already oh. muted, Jake. No, he's not muted. No, you guys are on your speakers. Turn down. All right, switch the input on the. Yeah, it's our. Oh, yes, that's fine. Do that. Yes. Okay. Sorry, Jake. Yeah. Figure it out now. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Joyce, we can't hear you now. So one thing I was wondering about is I know some other um, places they'll do like paving stones where you can purchase a stone to get it engraved. Have we considered looking at that for the observatory? Possibility. Um, obviously, we'd have to go through the, the uh, Parks and Wildlife bureaucracy. I don't know what that would do to, um, to the idea, but we could check into it. have to be new paving stones. I'm sorry? It'd have to be new paving stones. We're not taking out the ones that are already there to carve them. Just yeah. no, <laughs> right on, on the spot. Okay. So, you know, I, I'm appreciating getting all these, these, these different uh, ideas. So, I, we have had uh, questions about uh, the possibility of selling merchandise at uh, our star party in the state park. So, we cannot do that. Yeah. I've been told that. But um, I never have really asked, I'm going to, about the possibility of some donations mm -hmm. at this. And give away celebrate. things and get donations. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what Techmos used to do at AUTS to get around. Yeah. That was more like so items with donation. Donation. Yeah. Um, suggested donation. Yeah. So anyway, I'll um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, Jess, do you have anything from IDA? Um, I just wrote up a blurb about the latest advocates meeting. Um, it was pretty interesting. It was about light pollution and social justice and how it affects urban neighborhoods. So it's in the newsletter if anybody's interested. Okay. And then Dawn, I know you have a. I don't do something that's going to come up with me. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, the announcement went out in the sidereal times, but for those of you who haven't read it yet, uh, we are wrapping up the globular cluster challenge. Um, so for anyone that did take observations between July and the um, take the, between July and the end of this month, uh, the submission deadline is for the 31st of October. Um, we also have two new AL observing programs, which came out of this year's Al um, Astronomical League Conference. So one is called the Solar Neighborhood Observing Program. Um, and the way they describe that is intended to introduce observers to the stars located near our sun. Um, mm. So not sure how, how near that is. Um, haven't taken a, a full look at the list, uh, but it looks like it's depending on uh, which level you want to go for, it's anywhere between 10 to 30 to 100 activities or observations. Uh, the second one that was introduced, which was something I was also not aware of, is the Bennett Observing Program. So apparently the Bennett List is the South Hemisphere equivalent of the Messier List, um, which I kind of thought we all had the same Messier List, but the objects on the Bennett List are 150. We know that there's only 109, 110, depending on which camp you live in uh, for Messiers. Uh, so that is definitely worth checking out. The AL is also looking for new observing program coordinators. Um, so right now, the ones that they are in the market for uh, acquiring are for the Bennett Observing Program, so the new one, uh, two Galileo certificates, a Jupiter Observing Program, their mentor award, a NASA Observing Challenge certificate, a special solar eclipse observing award that is in the process of being planned and the solar neighborhood observing program. So information is in the Senior Euro Times on how to contact Aaron Covington, who's the observing program director. If any of y'all are interested in becoming one of those coordinators, um, you can reach out to him. And I would say if that's something that interests you, but maybe not these specific programs, keep checking back on the AO website um, as it sounds like they'll be adding a few more in the next few months for that. Um, Otherwise, sort of stealing from some of Jess's Night Sky Month. Um, as I mentioned before, October is Hill Country Night Sky Month. It is our third one this year. And there's going to be a whole slew of activities and events starting on the first with International Observe the Moon Night. Um, we are hoping to get the entire Hill Country to participate in a full, like Central Texas full moon howl at 8.30. Uh, on Sunday the night. Um, so we're hoping to get a lot of uh, interest drawn up in that. We've had a lot of communities in the past that hold full moon panels. We're going for like the big shebang and just getting everyone in Central Texas involved. Um, but you can go to Hill Country Alliance's website, hillcountryalliance.org, to find the calendar of events. Um, it also, is, we have a new calendar feature which allows you to enter events very easily and get them added to the calendar. Um, and let's see what else. For anyone interested, they just released the information for the American Astronomical Society's Fall Eclipse Workshop, which is the 20th and 21st of October in Rochester, New York. So let me know if anyone's going, because I'm going to be attending. Um, and I'll be reporting back on that <laughs> to the club and to our Eclipse Roundtable uh, committees on return. Um, I think that's it. Any questions for Don? So howling at the moon is about like waving at Saturn a few years ago when they were taking the picture. Hmm. But it sounds better. Yeah. Because you get to howl. So, so speaking of howling, didn't we do an experiment about having dogs at Star Party? It's the other <laughs> what, were they, what was the answer? Was that seen as a good thing or a bad thing? The experiment. Did they they bring a dog? I don't know. Because <laughs> I, 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 I wasn't able <laughs> But they're a club member that requested it. Yeah, because we've got dogs who are quite old and they're, we would like them to come with us, but we don't want to. 
they're, they're not rambunctious animals, but we would like to. I thought I saw a dog policy out at Bad Wolf that was okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. as long as they were. Oh, we did decide. You could ask Alan. <laughs> yeah, we coordinated uh, when we go and go outside and yeah. a couple of others talked about it. And yeah, there, there's the requirements are listed on the, I think it's the flyers all out, the instructions for being out there. And the folks yeah, there. I think yeah. Chris put it in the email that he mm -hmm. sent about the, the star party. Yeah, yeah, I think I saw one little dog out there. Yeah, all I mean, I mean, basically, it sounded like as long as your dog's not a barker, right? You're well, not going to have much problem. Like, right. There are the stickers out there. So I took my dog out there once. Yeah, yeah I don't want to offend anybody or just it's, these older dogs are just. Um, it's nicer to have them around. Maybe. I think we decided that was exactly the kind of situation where it was going to be fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. and you know, somebody said their dog would mainly stay in the car. So, uh, but but he couldn't leave the dog for as as long as he could be out there. So, they lay a blanket next to your setup and let probably sleep there. And I think another part of it was if you were walking the, with, around with the dog to kind of give the astronomers a, a heads up that you were coming mm -hmm. with the dog. So, yeah. like the people that are allergic to dogs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Encourages everyone to keep their cases up off the ground. That's mm -hmm. true. And, you know, we, all, we always say no dogs except service animals at public star parties, but uh, it's a little bit harder to control that than it is to control what members do. And we're always afraid that the leash is going to get caught up around the, right. uh, the scopes. And actually, we did have uh, yes, a couple of dogs at a recent star party, and they were barking at each other. And mm -hmm. so that's oh, yeah. kind of yeah. trying to avoid. But, yeah, you get a lot of disturbed by the child or something. Right. Don't want that. Well, and there's some cat, you know, kids, some kids, some kids are afraid of dogs. Or they could bite them. The kids yeah. could go jumping at the dog. Yeah. There's yeah. always the, the pink problem. So. Yeah. Yeah. But thinking about these and dealing with those issues, it's, we decided it's, it's okay. It was pretty responsible. Yeah, exactly. Well, I brought her to a work party out at Bad Bull, and our dog just Stay in the car. Yeah. Uh, very, very, very I mean, happy to stay in the car while I was working. If it's successful, we could maybe start selling, you know, either glow in the dark or red light collars. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'd like that. <laughs> there are opportunities. Okay. That's it for reports. <laughs> the next thing we have is old business, which is to approve the budget, which we did not do last last month said we did not have a quorum. Counting the people on Zoom, which the AC has decided we should, we have a quorum to not score. So let's do the budget. I'm not going to go through every item. I make a motion. Is there a way to put this on? Can y'all hear me now? Yes. Hi, Jake. We got Jake. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, Jake. Hello, Jake. So hopefully there was a mute there and not here. But anyway, I did want to mention that I set up a Discord server for the Austin Astronomical Society, and uh, it's it's still in uh, uh, initial phases. It's not completed being set up. But if anybody wants to beta test, let me know. And that's all I got. Doc cams, there's not going to be you can't share the screen. Not really. I can put the camera on, the camera on, but I don't know how good it'll be. All right. Well, this is this is published in the newsletter. I'm not going to go through it line by line. Let me just say revenues mostly from well, entirely in this budget from club dues and then a little bit of interest income. Uh, expenses, bad wolf, Paternalis Falls, storage, which we're attempting to uh, uh, minimize, uh, website expense, we're talking about making that smaller, insurance, we have to pay, I don't think there's any way to do anything about that, and then various smaller amounts for the different uh, programs, such as outreach and member services, and so forth. 
Zoom, pay for Zoom. We, we've got a line item of astronomy on tap, at which we milled out. Or, right. I mean, they have disappeared. They're they trying have. to make a comeback. It's probably going to be a little while, though. Right. Especially yeah, since they lost that the end, but yeah, yeah, there's no. They, they lost the North Door with the pandemic. So they're finding, trying to find a new leadership and trying to find a new bed. We've got that drinking thing going on. So I'm really yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got to be family friendly, too. So. so yeah, uh, Nerd, Nerd Night actually did move to a uh, to a space up in uh, North Austin, but it's it's probably too small for yeah. for uh, yeah. they were also strong on tap. One thing I will point out, if anybody has happened to notice it, uh, Sean realized that the total the, the Zoom expense had not been added in, so the total on this budget is different from the total. In the budget that was in the August newsletter, but these these are correct numbers. So, um, is there any objection to approving this budget? Motion to approve. Okay. Second. Any more discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All right. We got it. Thank you. Um, I don't point out that uh, next to it, Nick, we did a good job of uh, putting these two things right next to each other, is information about the fundraising survey that went out yesterday, and I heard today from uh, Anthony, who's been working on it, a member at large, that we've already had 50 responses, so that's, that's really encouraging, but uh, if you didn't get the email or if you want to just go to the newsletter, and find the link if you haven't already filled out the survey. Uh, you, can, you can do that, and uh, we will appreciate any thoughts and ideas that people have about uh, money. Okay. Uh, is there any new business, Don? I forgot one more thing. Okay. Um, it is in the city of real times. However, we're working on getting the Travis County Friends of the Night Sky band back together. Um, so if anyone's interested, we're having an information session at the North REI Community Room on the 17th, is that right? I think so. Yes, like 17th, 17th. Uh, from 2 to 3. So please uh, come and join us. It's part of a currently group of 14 other Night Sky groups across, I think we're at 11 counties right now. And, uh, we started in 2020, but the pandemic kind of beat us down a bit. So now we're coming back and getting out there and fighting the good fight against light pollution. Yeah. Is there anything else? Any new business? Mm -hmm. no, uh, when is that? That is the seventh Saturday, the seventh. Yeah, the same day as our Penner Laws Fall Star Party, but but we're during the day. We're just in the day. <laughs> <laughs> so you can just stop there on the way out. Uh, yes, uh, it is a week from tomorrow. I'd like to point out that my column in today's newsletter was all about the uh, eclipse and what we are doing uh, working to uh, find places where our members can be for the solar eclipse in uh, April of 2024. So if you want to read about where we are on that, go to the newsletter. All right. Anything else? All right, Jamie, would you introduce our speaker? Thanks, Joyce. Thanks. Okay, and uh, Amy again. Um, so I'm really excited about this. I um, reached out to Dr. Tertia, um and help me if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, sir. Um, You're doing great, thank you. Sounds good, thank you. <laughs> and um, I had first heard about him from Greg, our member of Greg, who had heard him speak at uh, Rose City Astronomers? Is that it? That's an Oregon, yep, um, Oregon. Uh, astronomy club. And so he had suggested that I uh, track this guy down and see if he could uh, speak to us. So, yes, um, I sent out an email and um, he replied right away and was 
was very generous. And um, when I sent out the um, notice for the meeting a couple of days ago, I did include a link to his bio on the uh, NASA JPL website. So cool. Um, and I have in this kind of, um, you know, a lengthy bio. It's very impressive, but I think, and I was trying to figure out how can I summarize this? And, um, and he, he just has a lot of uh, credentials and um, impressive uh, feats and projects. But I think what I'm going to do is just read this uh, one sentence. And um, I think this covers everything. And it says, um, Dr. Tereshev is an astrophysicist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology, and a professor at the Physics and Astronomy Department of the University of California in Los Angeles. Wow, okay, that's just really cool. So I think that covers it. There's a, um, a list of where he has received his education in um, Moscow State University. I'm not gonna try and say the word in Moscow, but anyway, just wonderful stuff. But, I am so honored. I was honored to um, email with the gentleman and thank you, sir. And um, I'm honored he's going to speak to our group and mm -hmm. um, have at it. Thank you. Excellent, Joyce. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, dear colleagues, it's uh, my honor to be here at, the, at your uh, meeting. And I think now I realize what I was uh, missing all my life. It's being part of a community like yours. You certainly have uh, picked the best places in the solar system for wonderful parties you're about to have. So oh. it's, it's, it's something that I really would, would enjoy to join. So um, that speaks to your thrive to life and the interest of uh, living the life at fullest. Speaking about life, I'm just asking you one, one question. Do you think there is life outside Earth's atmosphere? Just think about this. Is there a life outside Earth's atmosphere? Of course, we know our planet is wonderful and we live on it. But uh, is there a life outside the Earth's atmosphere? <coughs> and yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. <laughs> somewhere there is. And the answer is, uh, so this is our wonderful planet and we enjoy, uh, enjoy this planet. We see a great picture, which is uh, 10,000 by 10,000 pixels and we definitely see the continental lines, weather patterns. We see a lot of blue, which is our water, which provides life uh, for the planet. And this, this is amazing. But then the question is, is there life outside the, the, this uh, thin layer we call atmosphere? And yes, the answer is yes. But uh, sort of this is the life we have, what we have now. <laughs> this is us on the space station, right? So this is our friends who are orbiting our planet Earth and they enjoy seeing us from above. And this is amazing. So, but I guess my question was a little bit further. Uh, I, should, I should have been asking, is there life outside the solar system? And so this is what we are gonna be talking about. So how we will see that life and how we will be able to confirm its existence and what are the technologies we have today to do that. So this work is based on our uh, effort that for the last five years we conducted under wonderful support from NASA. It's a NASA Innovative Advanced Concept, uh, NIAC uh, Institute that funded our phase one, phase two and phase three efforts. So phase three was uh, sort of, it's a very rare uh, uh, grant that they give. But I think our grant was the third one in the history of uh, NIAC and it's rather sizable amount. So it's uh, this money are given to people to basically graduate from the kindergarten. In a sense, you come into NIAC with your wonderful idea and they give you uh, support for the first two phases and you demonstrate that you have a feasible way out. You can actually go into real life and start building the project. Phase three is given for you to do just that. And so we are completing this uh, phase three effort within the next few weeks, by the end of September. And so today I will be talking about the work we have done for the last several years. And I will be going rather fast. So if uh, any of you will have any question, just stop me there and just ask me a question. I will be happy to discuss it because obviously materials, uh, I have a lot of materials. So uh, the name of this project, the title is of course, Direct Imaging and Spectroscopy of Exoplanet, Exoplanets with the Mission to the Solar Gravitational Lens. And this is a group of uh, core scientists and engineers who contributed to 
this effort from Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Aerospace Corporation, Explore, the company, the new, new space company up in Seattle, NASA Marshall Split, Space Flight Center, and uh, UCLA and Westland University. The community is actually quite larger, but uh, these are the core people who contributed to this effort. So talking about life, why are we interested in this? Because basically it comes back to our, to the child, the inner child in, uh, within each of us. So remember ourselves being six years old, laying under starry night and looking at, at, at stars and possibly having a conversation like this one. You ever wonder what's up there? All right. Maybe someone up there was wondering what it's like here. I guess. Do you think we'll ever need them? I hope so. Don't you? Yes, I hope so. We will meet them. And the reality is that within the life of this generation of humans, we have all the technologies that may enable us to see surfaces of exoplanets and potentially see those that are inhabited, habitable or inhabited uh, as we speak. So this is something amazing. I will be talking about this during this uh, uh, an hour of my presentation. So um, this is our, the, this is the family portrait. So this is a wonderful family portrait of, of our solar system. Starting from the left, it's our sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, all of those wonderful planets that actually are, are forming the solar system. And so this is the cradle of humanity. And at some point, humanity is destined to leave this cradle. Not now, but it will take some time for us to travel to nearby stars, maybe two to 300 years from today. But today we are destined to study those very uh, the remote destinations with technologies that we have at hand rem through remote sensing, the larger telescopes, uh, facilities that we fly around, uh, around the sun, uh, and heliocentric orbits, uh, the ground-based telescopes, and we'll talk briefly about those. So reality is that this is our solar system and we traveled through every possible destination in the solar system. They visited Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. We travel to Mars quite regularly. Lately, we visited there uh, with uh, many uh, uh, rovers. And so the most impressive, of course, is the Curiosity, which is now working on the surface of this planet. And of course, that wonderful uh, helicopter that is out there, Ingenuity, that is uh, making the first flight our, of, of a rotor craft on the different on the on the planet in the solar system outside Earth. So, but we are looking for life, and so we think that life may exist in those uh, destinations uh, outside Earth. Of course, we're looking for intelligent life, and at, uh, at times we are questioning whether or not the life on this planet is intelligent. So, what do we ask for? We're asking for maybe something organic. We don't expect to see those little green people, uh, little. Green, uh, green people on the surface of Mars, but we do expect to find some bacterial life. And so hopefully there will be microbial or bacterial life we, will be, we are destined to discover by, with the new generation of uh, rovers and uh, vehicles that will be deployed on the surface of Mars. But what I'm uh, looking at is really those icy worlds, the orbit, uh, the, the, those uh, satellites of Jupiter and, uh, you, and, and Saturn, especially Europa that orbits Jupiter with a thick layer of ice and there is a lot of, uh, um, there is a very significant ocean and warm ocean. So potentially if we land there, we can uh, drill uh, and uh, drill the hole and uh, deploy a little submersible in that ocean. We can study that ocean and potentially see volcanoes on the surface of Europa. And so that would be wonderful. Another favorite destination of mine is Enceladus, which is a satellite of Saturn because the Enceladus has a lot of plumes uh, going through the ice uh, icy surface of Enceladus, and those plumes indicate not only it's water, of course, but the water plumes and Cassini spacecraft uh, um, imaged and detected uh, those water molecules on its uh, in situ uh, detector. And so, but we are looking, we are looking for potentially finding organic life in uh, in the in, cell, or in the in the water in the ocean of Enceladus. So these are the destinations in the solar system. But reality, we don't see those uh, places where another. Uh, civilization may exist. And we're interested in doing just that because it is wonderful to, to discover that in the solar system, to discover uh, molecules and organics and different planets. And we have to do that. This is very exciting, confirming that life is not only in the solar system, it's, it's not on, on, on Earth, but life is ubiquitous. And this is what we're trying to prove. But what 
I mean, uh, what do we think about other planets, other other planets that orbit in other stars, exoplanets? I'll have to is, unmute to say. Uh, is it was there a question? Yes. Okay, please. Yes, um, we've we've been told that we've been able to get um, rocks from Mars. We've been able to collect them in Antarctica. So that leads me to believe that we've been able to send rocks from um, from Earth to other planets also. Presumably, there have been microbes on those rocks as they've left the Earth. Have we been sending life to all these planets, to all these, uh, you know, Enceladus, to Europa, all these places? Are we just going to meet ourselves there when we go in, and uh, send our probes? Wonderful question. We don't know. We definitely were ascending through the millions of years of existence of our planet. We were sending rocks throughout the solar system and in space. Definitely, we, were, we, we found a lot of rocks uh, on, in Antarctica that came from, uh, from Mars. And ob obviously, not only in Antarctica, those rocks will be throughout ev through, uh, everywhere in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, on, on the surface of Earth. It's just in Antarctica, we were able to find them untouched. So like, for, for example, if you go to Sahara Desert, you will see those meteorites and rocks from Mars as well. But uh, coming from uh, Mars, we were able to, do, to find uh, quite a few rocks in Antarctica. It is quite likely that we were able to send those rocks you know, further. And uh, uh, especially during the early parts of uh, solar system evolution, where a lot of bombardment uh, happened. And so it is likely that uh, the idea of panspermia, where life is actually travels through the solar system. It's not only rocks of, of, uh, which uh, were originated in the solar system. What about interstellar asteroids that start, uh, that, that seem, uh, start to visit us quite regularly? We have detected two of them, uh, Oumuamua and uh, Borisov. So one, one interstellar asteroid, another one in this interstellar comet. Once our detection capabilities of ground-based facilities will improve, we expect to see quite a few of those interstellar visitors. So where life originated? Life originated on this planet or it, it, it was sent to us from, some, from somewhere else? We don't know yet. We need, to have a compar a compar we need to do a comparative study and see if the DNA of the organic life that we found, let's say on, on Enceladus or on, uh, you know, on, in, on Europa will match something that we have here. And so that would be a very interesting comparative study of organic life or, or so, so, sort of the basis of, of life in the solar system. And then when, once we will be able to meet with interstellar asteroids and potentially find some uh, traces of organics on the surfaces of those interstellar visitors, that will be another comparative study done to compare life here in the solar system with life formed elsewhere. So it's an exciting uh, period of um, uh, uh, or astrobiology that we live in, the technologies here, uh, to study those questions. And we would be doing that uh, with the uh, uh, sampling of rocks from Mars, bringing them uh, Mars sample return mission that is now being uh, developed at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the collaboration with our European colleagues. And at some point in the next six years, we should be able to send that mission and get those rocks back, those rocks that Perseverance is now collecting. And so the Mars uh, sample return mission will bring those rocks back and we will analyze if we will be able to find those rocks directly on, uh, I mean, we will be able to find organic life or organic molecules on the or traces of those molecules on the rocks uh, collected on Mars. And so that will be exciting. So this is exciting, exciting field. And I can talk about this uh, for a long time, but let me get back to my <laughs> presentation. <laughs> so uh, uh, the planets are very uh, uh, plenty. They're, you, uh, they're uh, pretty much everywhere in, this, in, in, in our galaxy. We know that by the current estimates that 50% of stars have planets. There are about 10, uh, 100 billions of uh, stars in our galaxy alone. And so we expect that there will be trillions of uh, planets in the solar system. Exoplanet census by today suggests that we were able to find and confirm almost 5,000 exoplanets uh, doing multiple uh, uh, search uh, uh, missions. We have done this with the Kepler telescope, with the TESS spacecraft uh, mission that is now uh, uh, working and doing something that we call transit spectroscopy and transit method to discover exoplanets. And so there are almost 9,000 exoplanets that are yet to be confirmed through multiple observations. And so uh, of those planets, we, of those planets found, we now understand that almost 4,000, 3,800 of those planets found are formed in the planetary systems. 
So planets do not come by one, they come with fa in families and this is exciting. So it's our solar system is pretty much replicated everywhere in the, so in the galaxy, except we don't really know how the super Jupiters, uh, the, the planets with the very heavy and large, uh, with the heavy, heavy, heavy and the heavy mass and large uh, uh, sort of radii would uh, be formed in the orbit of Mercury. So this is very exciting. We don't know that planetary theory suggests that the, uh, the, the gaseous uh, uh, giants should be formed on the outskirts of planetary system, but yet you find a lot of those exoplanets in the very close proximity to their host stars. And out, out of those uh, planets that I just mentioned, 188 planets terrestrial, that means that they have uh, a solid surface. We expect them to have solid surface and uh, like similar to Mercury, uh, Venus and uh, uh, Earth and Mars. So they're in, they're in the inner parts of the uh, planetary systems. And uh, some of them are orbiting the host stars in the, the distance where water may exist in three states, uh, liquid, uh, the, the, the liquid, ice, and the vapor. So that means that the thermal conditions on the surface of that exoplanet are amazing so that uh, life may exist. So this is some, somewhere we call um, the habitable zone. And so our the habitable zone in the solar system is uh, anywhere, it's a little bit further away from Venus and all the way just touching Mars. And so we live in the habitable system. And so we are about to find those planets in the habitable system or, or in, in the habitable zone for orbiting other planets. So, but the challenge is there's sort of the, it's, it's a census, exoplanetary census. Most of those exoplanets were discovered using something called transit uh, method where exoplanet transit in the, the disk of that uh, host star and the brightness of that host star uh, varies periodically. And so when we detect uh, that periodicity, we can actually study that uh, uh, that object and confirm its existence through multiple observations. The radial velocities uh, method, where we study Doppler shift, how the spectra of the host star changes periodically, and that in, uh, uh, that, that is happening uh, under gravitational reflex motion, uh, because uh, for example, if there is a binary system, uh, the host star and the large planet, so the binary system moves uh, with respect to its common center of mass. So the spectra of the light that is emitted by the host star will be periodically changing to green, uh, to, I mean, to red and then to blue part of the spectrum. So that allows us to, con to, to study those uh, the presence of the exoplanets. The micro lens in quite a few planets were discovered, but it's not that it's gravitational micro lens. And when light travels by the massive uh, body, trajectory of light is uh, altered. It's the light is light rays are bending. Uh, and so essentially that method is used to discover exoplanets. And I will, I will be talking about a variant of that method uh, using uh, with the slow gravitational lens. And few planets were discovered with direct imaging where we are dealing with the very large planets such as super Jupiters, maybe 12 times uh, the mass of Jupiter being orbiting the host, star, host stars at very large distances. So James Webb was able to discover one of those exoplanets orbiting its host star using infrared spectroscopy. And so th these are the tools we have today in our disposal. But we are looking for something that we uh, would, uh, uh, would resemble our own planet, our own Earth. We're looking for terrestrial exoplanets, similar to with, with the mass and uh, the, 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 the size of our own planet orbiting the, the host stars in the habitable zone. This is a list of um, nearby stars within 100 light years away from us. And those stars uh, have, uh, conf we confirmed that those, uh, those stars have uh, uh, planets orbiting them. So reality is that, so we, we see that the planets are pretty much everywhere around most of the stars. We just need to find a, a very sensitive technology to detect them. And so the, uh, the number of exoplanets will grow. And this is amazing because uh, this opens up a very new area for in astronomy. And so looking at the te te techniques and those of spacecraft that were that are working now and they're going to be and, and, and those that will be working soon. For example, Kepler was a very effective uh, workhorse to discover exoplanet using transit uh, transit method. The TESS um, uh, the spacecraft is orbiting uh, our uh, orbiting Earth now in space. And it's also continuing the, the work that was initiated by Kepler, discovering a lot of exoplanets as well. As, you, we, as we all know, James Webb was uh, uh, launched last year in December. Now it's becoming a premier uh, facility to discover exoplanets and to conduct very unique 
astrophysical observations. We expect a lot of interest and discoveries from James Webb. And we are building something called a W first uh, mission that will uh, have a very interesting instrument called coronagraph to block the light from the from the host star and uh, potentially start seeing uh, a, a tiny a tiny exoplanets orbiting those host stars. So the W first will be launched hopefully by 2026 and will be another interesting uh, instrument to, to look forward to. So European colleagues have launched uh, Gaia and Gaia is an astrometric, astrometric satellite. It was working since I think uh, to 2004 in, 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 in orbit around Earth. And essentially Gaia was able to build a major catalog with the, oh, about a billion stars with the precision of 50 micro arc seconds. And this is amazing catalog because now we have positions and proper motions of many stars. At some point, we expect to see a um, Euclid mission launched by European Space Agency, maybe next year uh, in the soon. So, but the, 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 this, this is the current set of instruments that we have uh, in space. Uh, those missions that are able to look for exoplanets, not see them directly, but see them indirectly. I'd like to emphasize because none of those instruments are capable to see the surfaces of exoplanets because they don't have enough resolving power, but they have enough uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, photometric capabilities to detect the presence of those exoplanets. The challenge there, if you want to see uh, planets, small planets, similar to our Earth, it's of course the tyranny of diffraction limit. So this is the selfie that uh, Cassini spacecraft took of us. Everybody who sits in this room and don't, lives on this planet this is all us. See this little tiny dot, this is planet Earth. So for that, uh, for, for, for pictures uh, uh, to be taken this way, we need to have a significant light amplification. And for that, we need larger apertures of the telescopes. So the, the camera was uh, used, uh, Cassini uh, imaging uh, space system was used for this purpose. And it was an amazing camera, was able to capture Earth as a single dot, single, uh, and this is as much as we uh, actually can do with the planetary uh, cameras. So the challenge is we need to have a uh, light amplification. In addition, we need to have a resolution. So here you see a picture of again, our own planet taken from the surface of Mars by um, Curiosity rover on January 31st, uh, 2014. So we need not only light amplification, but also resolution. Uh, what not seen here and is taken on the next uh, slide uh, in, in, in this picture, essentially Earth and the Moon. So the Earth and the Moon system was imaged directly from the surface of Mars. So you see not only not only light amplification to see Earth to, to see our planet as a single dot, but to be able to resolve the two celestial bodies from each other. That is uh, that is uh, um, uh, angular resolution. This is what we need uh, from the telescopes to be able to detect. Tiny, uh, tiny planets orbiting their uh, host stars. For example, just to give you a, a background, this is comparative, uh, 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 this is size comparison between planets and the solar, uh, planets and the solar system. Of course, this red uh, giant is our, uh, is our uh, sun. And the tiny little rocks here on the bottom, it's uh, our planet Earth. So this is a very small, uh, small planet that does not emit light. It only reflects light. And so think how to find the firefly on the background of a searchlight. So you will, it will be very challenging because uh, the firefly is extremely uh, uh, tiny and emits a very faint uh, 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 signal. So, but the searchlight is bright. So we need to be able to find the tiny rock orbiting the host star at a very large distance. And so this is a challenging endeavor. This is why we need the significant light amplification and resolution. Um, this, is what, this is what we can do today using direct imaging. Again, I mentioned that uh, direct imaging can be done from uh, the telescopes in space, and some of them also can be used for those on the ground. Direct imaging is an exciting technique because uh, if uh, all previous techniques are allowing us to see, uh, to find exoplanets indirectly by uh, looking at the reflex motion of their host stars, here, we can actually start imaging those uh, planets uh, directly. And so usually it is done in the infrared band because it's much easier to detect them in infrared. In optical, it's uh, quite hard. And those planets need to be far away from the host stars. So in this case, for example, you see in the middle, in the middle uh, slide, you see four planets uh, uh, orbiting uh, 
HD 8799, 133 light years away from us. And so the scale of this distance is 20 astronomical units. This is the scale. And so this is essentially uh, super Jupiters and uh, they're not resolved. You see the blob of light, they're not resolved. They're pretty much unresolved pictures of those, uh, uh, those uh, giant exoplanets. And so you see different pictures here, 100 or 310 uh, light years away. You also see this, you know, uh, small blobs of light which are not resolved. And again, using uh, using the technique uh, Eridani 51 Eridani B, uh, blocking the light from the host star, we, we we see a blob of light, unresolved images of the exoplanet orbiting uh, uh, that star at what is uh, 96 light years away from us. So that's the, these are the challenges. These are the techniques that we have today. We will see. Is there a question? Oh yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm moving on. So um, th these are the techniques that we have today. And these are the amazing techniques to confirm that indeed uh, planets are out there and we can see them directly. But these are not the planets that we would like to discover because we would like to discover those exoplanets that would have a solid uh, surface and then uh, would have the atmospheres and will be tiny, like similar to our own Earth. That's sort of the guidance we have uh, from... Uh, from our studies of who, who we are. And we would like to discover kind of resemblance of uh, us in, uh, on the planets and uh, on, the, on the surface of distant exoplanets. So this is the recent discovery made by a Webb Space Telescope. It was only released uh, September 1st. See, it's the first ever direct image of the, uh, the 12th uh, uh, Jupiter mass exoplanet orbiting its host star at uh, 355 light years away. And you see, this is a not resolved image. It's wonderful. And we will see many of those pictures. They're, these are pictures are amazing. They're beautiful and they're done with a very high precision. And uh, I'm very proud that you know, JPL contributed a MIDI camera, which is used to, the, to, 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 to discover the exoplanet. And so that is the confirmation that planets do exist. And the, right. Yes, please, do you have a question? I'm sorry, yeah, okay. Then I'm just moving on. Um, so this is great. And uh, the challenge is that we are not able to see the surfaces of those exoplanets with these techniques. We will be able to collect a lot of information to discover many of those uh, unresolved uh, images, unresolved uh, uh, images of the exoplanets. But uh, we, we are not going to be able to, to, to see them because remember light amplification resolution comes with the, with the aperture of the telescope. And uh, for... Um, how small of a super Jupiter are we going to be able to see with Webb? I think with Webb, it depends on the uh, distance to the host, uh, to, to the star. Of course, the closer the star is, uh, the easier it will be to see that because so what we're looking at, some sort of the uh, Webb uh, resolution, uh, imaging resolution, I think it's uh, 40 million seconds. So from 40 million seconds, you can put uh, what is the radii of the planet divided by the distance to the exoplanet? That actually gives you a uh, sort of anticipated si size of the exoplanet. So realistically, we will be able to see maybe uh, maybe three to five mass uh, uh, exo-Jupiters uh, within 100 uh, uh, per sec from us, 100 light years from us. And so that's kind of what uh, we are looking at. And so we will see many of those objects. Uh, uh, I hope we will see many of those objects uh, through the web data. And this is a very exciting era in astronomy. So there will be many of those discoveries. But let me sort of move towards the objective of my presentation. So if I take our own planet Earth and I move a planet Earth at 100 light years away from us to, to see that object with just one pixel diffraction, uh, uh, limited telescope must have a diameter of 90 kilometers. I repeat, so it is one pixel to be able to see a diffraction limited image of that object, 13,000 kilometers diameter at 100 light years away, just single pixel, the diameter of that telescope must be 90 kilometers. Just for the reference, the, the boundary of space, the internationally accepted boundary of space, it's 100 kilometers, it's a Van Karman line, right? So we're just about 10 kilometers shy from the size of the, so from the uh, Von Karman line. So, and if you're familiar with Los Angeles, Jet Propulsion Laboratory is shown here. 
and the city of Dana Point is uh, close halfway to San Diego. So this is the diameter of the telescope. I don't think it's going to be practical to think about building a telescope of that size. And remember, this is only just one pixel, right? And so we are not talking about a very distant exoplanet. It's still in our neighborhood, 100 light years away from us. But just think the tyranny of the diffraction limit. That's what actually it, it requires from us. It's uh, if you want to have image like uh, like the one that's shown here, which I opened my opened up my presentation, which is 10,000 by 10,000 pixels. If you want to see an image of that size, we need to multiply that 990 kilometers by 10,000. So that's the diameter of the uh, telescope we must uh, have to be able to see that image with such an amazing resolution. So that's kind of reality. So if we continue with the same uh, evolutionary path by building ever larger telescopes, we are not going to be able to see the surfaces of exoplanets. And uh, that's kind of the realization we, we came up with about uh, six years ago when we start looking at something different. We call it the Solar Gravitational Lens Telescope. But uh, just to give you an impression what we can do today in terms of telescopes, on the right-hand side, you see pretty much the history of the telescope building, starting from uh, the Hale Telescope on Mount Palomar, 1948, it's 200 inch. Then uh, we go through different other telescopes. And ultimately, what, what, you see, what, what, what you have here circled in the red circle, it's a European extremely large telescope that is being built now in Chile, which is 39 meters in diameter. In the, on the left, you see this is the ELT being built now in Chile, and uh, hopefully it will, I don't think they will get the first light in 2022, but soon they will get their first light. And so that will be the largest telescope on the planet, and th th that will be followed by the 30-meter telescope that is now being built in Hawaii. And so this is, uh, this are the telescopes that we are able to fly today, I mean, to, to build today on the, on, on the surface of the, on, on the ground. Going forward in space, you're all familiar with the capability of, of James Webb. James Webb has 6.5 meters in diameter. It's not even close to 90 kilometers that we need. We have studied multiple telescopes in, at NASA. I think uh, before the decadal uh, was released, uh, recent decadal in astrophysics, we did the study of 16 meter telescope and 24 meters telescope that will use advanced technologies, uh, segmented mirrors, and essentially that will be. Uh, I think Decadal recommended something, a 6.5 meter telescope again, but in a different band. And so realistically, we are not getting those, even those larger telescopes in the, in, within, within, our, within our lifetimes, essentially. So we would like to have a large telescope being built in space and so that it will be uh, away from the disturbances from Earth's atmosphere. And so reality is that if you follow that sort of uh, evolutionary path, but those exoplanets will not be able to see them. That's the challenge. This is why we decided to look at something which is quite unique, quite exciting, it's gravitational microlensing. And here you see an image taken again by James Webb on the initial uh, picture release on July the 12th of this year. You see those arcs uh, in the center of this image. Those arcs are something uh, we call Einstein arcs. It's a part of Einstein ring, essentially, this is the work of gravity, gravity in the universe. Those arcs are due to gravitational lensing by the galaxies, distant galaxies. And so when James Webb uh, looked at those uh, starry field, the, uh, those extended arcs are everywhere because this is how uh, gravitation changes the curvature of space time. And when light travels through that curvature, uh, it, it actually is shown as an Einstein ring. If the alignment between the source and the lens and us is perfect, if alignment is not perfect, for example, um, we are moving, we are slightly misaligned. We will see arcs, or maybe we'll see Einstein crosses. And so essentially, that's the gravitational microlensing. Uh, looking at this phenomena, we realize that uh, we need to look something closer to our to, to our home. And so this is the picture of our uh, neighborhood. On the left, you see the solar system. On the right, you see the, uh, our the closest neighbor, Alpha Centauri system. And it's about 26,000 astronomical units, or it's about 4.3 light years away. And so the distances here conveniently uh, presented in logarithmic scale. And so you see that pretty much everything, uh, once you leave the solar system, it's a lot of empty space. 
And when people are talking, uh, used to talk about travel into interstellar, uh, to, on an interstellar uh, flights and going to nearby stars, I uh, usually we lack a uh, practical approach here. Um, uh, in, in our effort, what we realize is that solar gravitational lens, which is uh, right in the middle uh, of that picture, which is at the distance the focal region of the solar gravitational lens. It's actually at the distance of 547 astronomical units away from the sun. And so Voyager 1 spacecraft, we see Voyager 2 and Voyager 1 spacecraft. Voyager 1 traveled, uh, presently travels at the distance of 156 astronomical units away. It was launched about more than 40 years ago with uh, 1974. Uh, uh, 70, uh, and essentially this uh, is a an, uh, is an technology of uh, uh, late 1960s. And it's still operational, still transmits data that gives confidence that yes, we can build spacecraft that can reach out those distant destinations. We just need to make sure that they will fly faster. And so that's the challenge we, we would like to address. But coming back to the solar gravitational lens, here on the bottom, you see pretty much an, a, a, a chart that shows how it works. If I have a light reflected by the exoplanet, exo-Earth, and that light, when it travels by the sun, the trajectory of light of, of, of photons, light rays, will be bent towards the sun because the gravity actually it's, uh, uh, affects the uh, trajectory of the light. Rays and, and, and two light rays enveloping the sun from two different distances, from two different uh, opposite sides, they will be uh, make, uh, they will be uh, intersecting each other at a very large distance, and that distance is roughly 547 astronomical units away. So this lens is a very interesting lens. It doesn't have a single focal point. It's because of its spherical aberration. It has a semi-infinite focal line, and so this is the focal line connecting the center of, the, uh, of that source, the center of the sun, and the, it, extending further away. So in the vicinity of that focal line, we see something called so something that we call strong interference region. If I will position a spacecraft there in that strong interference region, and if that spacecraft is equipped with something called coronagraph to block the light from the sun, on the sensor of that instrument, I will see Einstein ring when the spacecraft is perfectly aligned. So if uh, uh, taking, our uh, taking our Earth, and, uh, which is 13,000 uh, kilometers in diameter, moving it 200 light years away, so the image of that object will be a cylinder with a diameter of 1.3 kilometers. Yes. So, so that cylinder is formed starting from 547 astronomical units away. It will be a cylinder with a diameter 1.3 kilometers. If I put a single uh, uh, telescope, let's say with the one, uh, one meter telescope, I will be able to image that, uh, that image of, the, uh, of that um, exoplanet moving by pixel by pixel. In that way, I will be able to collect enough data. And then I will use something that we call the deconvolution technique to recover the image of that object. So that was the idea that we had back in 2016. After that, we started working on it. We built a significant foundation to understand optical properties of that lens. And so we realized that a lot of things actually uh, worked into our advantage. The, uh, I have to mention the first idea of using the sun as a gravitational lens was the due to von Ashelman who, uh, who wrote it uh, in uh, Science uh, magazine in uh, 1979. For Nashelman, he was the principal investigator on the radio science ex experiment on, uh, on Voyager 1. And he suggested to use that for communication purposes using microwaves. Later on, we realized that microwaves do not travel well through the solar corona. They will be refracted, but using light is actually quite, uh, quite good. So um, this is what we are, uh, this is how, if you position a spacecraft in the focal region of the solar gravitational lens, we see something that, that we call Einstein ring. This is Einstein ring that was, uh, in, uh, that came from Hubble. And so after that, what we do, we essentially, uh, if we block, uh, so uh, this is what we are gonna be able to see. This is the sun, and this is the uh, image of the exoplanet, which will be 1.3 kilometers in the thickness of that Einstein ring it's 1.3 kilometers. So this is the uh, Einstein ring that is formed by the light from the exoplanet. And if our uh, telescope has the coronagraph to block the sun, and after that, we should be able to collect brightness of that Einstein ring to, um, 
to measure it and actually use that brightness to recover image of the exoplanet. And so now we have, uh, that, that was the idea that was uh, guided our, our, uh, our, uh, our research starting, uh, starting to 2016. And now we have a very good uh, understanding of all the optical properties and how the image can be recovered. Moving on, just to give you a little summary of the optical properties. Um, the Question. Question. Please. Yes, please. The, the focal point on this lens is measured in, in light years, isn't it? This is a long focal length lens, right? A focal length of that um, a lens. Um, it's not a. It's not a focal point. There is a focal uh, semi-infinite line. That line begins at five hundred forty-seven astronomical units away, not light years. So. It is within the distance, a practical distance of thinking about deep space mission. So <laughs> if we, we can fly to that uh, uh, space spacecraft to that distance, when we position the spacecraft, it's in a practical sense, we don't need to stop. We just continue along that focal line collecting the data. It is not light years. It is uh, uh, hundreds of astronomical units outside the uh, heliosphere. So now if uh, uh, just summarizing the optical properties of that lens, the amplification factor provided by the solar, so solar gravity is quite significant. Uh, for one micron wavelength, the amplification factor is 10 to the 11th. Essentially, it's 100 billion times. So yes. and, uh, in addition to that, the, uh, the resolution of that object, lambda divided by the diameter, in, in this case, diameter of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of, uh, of our telescope is the, essentially the, the solar diameter. This is why the resolution of that lens is in nano seconds. It's not practical to think about building something like this with technology that we have, but nature gives this just, an, just a gift to us. And essentially, as I mentioned, the, in the extremely narrow pencil beam uh, that a solar gravity lens projects in its focal region, the image of the exo-Earth from 100 light years so well, will be just 1.3 kilometers. And so that's the summary of the optical properties. Now, uh, let me show how we actually, uh, what we will see. On the left, you see an image of our planet, black and white, uh, a thousand by thousand pixels. That's sort of original image. When I convolve that image with the point spread function of the solar gravitational lens, so essentially, uh, I'm passing the light through that, uh, uh, through that region around the sun. The image will be that fuzzy because the solar gravitational lens has something called a spherical aberration. It contributes to significant blur. But still, even with this blur, you see some continental lines, you see some, uh, some shades. Uh, in, in, the, in this image, you can potentially can recover that, uh, basically just, just looking at it. It's, it's already quite interesting. But we developed a technique that allows us to remove that blur. So again, from uh, this is for comparison, this is the so the, this is the image of our Earth, and depending on the resolution we would like to get, we potentially can com almost completely recover, remove all that blur, ultimately receiving the image here. So that is uh, uh, th that was initial indication that indeed the solar gravitational lens not only can be used for imaging, but also we are able to re re remove all the sort of uh, unwanted blur in the image plane and actually recover the full image of the exoplanet. Um, before I go there, let me just give you an impression how imaging is done. And just uh, stay with me for, 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 for a minute. Imagine yourself sitting in a movie theater and you sit in, uh, in, in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the uh, uh, theater, behind you, there is a projector and that projector projects a light beam on the screen that is in front of you. So that screen uh, reflects light and in your eyes, you get the full picture of that image that is being projected on the screen, right? And so because it's, uh, it's done in a such a way so that with our two eyes, we get the depth and we actually are able to uh, process that image. And so that's the typical uh, sort of the scene from the movie theater. Now remove that screen. You still have projector, but there is nothing against which the light will reflect. Uh, there is nothing where a light will reflect from. So light beam will still continue in space, but it will not stop, it will not reflect. Uh, we will not be sitting in the theater. We will not be able to see anything because there is no reflection. So there is no movie screen. 
Now, imagine yourself, you're standing up and you go on stage and you are now looking back at the projector, standing from that stage where, where the movie screen used to see, uh, hang. And so you're looking back at the projector and you don't see the full image, right? You see only flickering image of uh, the, the, the scenes that are being projected through the projector. You don't see the full image. But you know that the light field is there and all the information, it is there on the, on the stage where you stand. To do that, you need to move yourself from basically pixel to pixel, assemble all those brightness uh, um, that is, uh, col collect the brightness information that the projector projects at that particular moment. And then use that bright brightness to recover that image that you uh, wanted to recover. That's exactly what is happening here. Because, um, so this is the image on the right-hand side, which is projected by the slow gravitational lens on the image plane. Now, when I move a telescope in from pixel to pixel, I will collect the brightness of the Einstein ring or brightness of that a scene that is being projected in a particular position. And I use that information to recover the image. This is how the image recovery is done. So realistically, this is a very good technique to remove unwanted contributions from, uh, from your imaging system. So moving on, that was the, our first realization. So I hope sort of that movies theater analogy gives you a better way to understand what actually is being done. Uh, standing on a stage, you see, uh, you're looking back at the sun and you see the Einstein ring that is in front of you. You don't really need to resolve Einstein ring. You just need to collect the brightness of light at, at, the, at a particular location of the, uh, where, where you stand. As you move to a different location on, on, in, in, the, in, in the movie screen, the brightness of the Einstein ring changes and so on. That's, that, that's your information. That's what you use to then process the data. So, so I'm confused. I'm confused. Um, yeah. what, I, what I think thought I heard was that you're going to create a spacecraft that's going to go out to this focal line and then keep going. So it's not going to be able to go in an XY scan. That's going to keep on uh, you know, basically going out. And Absolutely. Then Yes, <laughs> and so it's not going to really scan except uh, except from what it can see. Um, do do I have the model correct? That you have the model correct, except uh, that spacecraft will be able to move laterally. It will be moving in the um, in uh, sort of x and y direction in the image plane. It will be moving as it moves with very large velocity away from the sun. It still moves. It it is able to move in the image plane. Does it make sense? So uh, it, it moves in the Z direction, but X and Y still you move uh, within the X and Y direction in the plane the where image is formed. Okay, that's a lot. That of, it sounds like that's a lot of fuel, but okay. Oh, no, 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 I, I, yeah, I will talk about this. If we, we don't, uh, the, the, the advantage here is that we need pretty much six micron per second squared delta V to move the spacecraft. It's not that much. And so with ion propulsion that we have today, we have uh, systems that are capable from uh, different uh, manufacturers. Uh, for example, Murphy's built those, uh, those propulsion, uh, propulsion uh, engines, ion propulsion. So ion propulsion is sufficient to move in the image plane. We don't need chemical propulsion. We are not relying on that. But when I will be talking about the image, uh, when, when I will be talking about the mission, you will see what I'm talking about. So here I'm just describing the optical properties. And so moving on. So would that also we, compensate for the planets rotating about the star and the star's motion uh, relative to the sun? For that, we would need, we are considering flying not one, but uh, several small telescopes, uh, five to be exact, three to five. And there are small spacecraft, uh, essentially, so moving this five telescopes, will be, we will be able to compensate for the, or, the orbit diurnal rotation. Orbital rotation is being taken care of by the movement of the sort of uh, in the Im image plane. But diurnal rotation, for example, if the planet, if, if the planet has 24 hours uh, period of the day, so we need to be able to, uh, to have uh, data taken with the resolution faster than, uh, let's say, 24 hours. In that sense, three to five spacecraft uh, moving in the image plane will be sufficient to collect enough data and to be able to remove, to, to actually, to, to remove the smearing because of the planetary diurnal rotation. This is so, no. mm. Say it again. 
is audacious as hell. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> we will talk about this. Just, just, just give me a few, few minutes to, to go through this. We realize that uh, the sun is not really a black body, so there is a lot of light, and the light is, uh, no, so a corona is significant contribution. Then we... we we need to be able to compensate for the brightness of the solar corona because this is the primary noise source. And so when we, uh, this is the data on the solar corona and electron density and the plasma. So we were able to model the solar corona. And so when we at the 600 astronomical units away, our Einstein ring comes rather close to the sun. So this is where um, if, if we exactly at 547 astronomical units away, our Einstein ring is formed at the distance where the ring is touching the sun. This is very bad because we, the brightness of the sun is, is uh, quite high. We need to put coronagraph to actually to be away from the solar surface. We, uh, we understood that moving the spacecraft a little bit further at 600 AU will be sufficient for us to start imaging campaign. Going all the way from 600 AU to pretty much 900 AU, this is where we are able to compensate for solar corona and we're able to actually to remove to, to, to be able to get enough data to start uh, making the imager. So the token, this is how we see, this is our image sensor on the spacecraft. So you see if the sun is black, there is no solar corona, for example. So uh, we see Einstein ring that is formed around the sun. Then uh, in reality, of course, the sun is bright. It, uh, there is significant brightness and the solar corona is essentially also contributes a lot of uh, uh, unwanted uh, unwanted noise. Using coronagraph, uh, which we designed, we, we can use internal coronagraph using typical Leo stop. And so with the internal coronagraph, we can block the sun, but we still need to deal with the solar corona because our Einstein ring comes uh, shining through the solar corona. So we, we don't want to um, constrain ourselves so, so that we will, we will receive uh, uh, as much light as possible. So we need to deal with the solar corona. So our uh, resolution element of the telescope, uh, given by the diameter of the telescope and the sort of wavelength, essentially it uh, forms a sort of a ring around, a sort of an annulus around the Einstein ring. This is where, this is the annulus where we collect a lot of uh, unwanted uh, signal from uh, solar corona. And so our Einstein ring light comes on top of that uh, solar corona light. That's what we need to deal with. And so re realistically with our design, we were able to design a coronagraph, but we don't need a significant contrast ratio such as exoplanetary coronagraph and 10, at, at 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight is sufficient for that purpose. And so we were, we were able to demonstrate that yes, we will be able to remove solar corona, not only the sun, but also solar corona significant level. And uh, we will be able to get enough uh, light to start building the, Im the images uh, on the background of solar corona. Um, what is interesting is that the spectroscopic capabilities are quite, quite impressive. Here, the signal to noise ratio for the optical band, we get uh, what, about a uh, signal to noise ratio of six with one meter telescope with 300 seconds integration. And we get a significant uh, SNR, let's say at, at, uh, SNR of two in one second integration using, uh, let's say even, uh, even a one meter telescope. And if, if we use 40 centimeter aperture, small telescopes, we get pretty much SNR of one at the wavelength of 14 micro on 20 micro. So what it says is that basically imaging in, in near infrared will be a very, uh, very, uh, very good. In that sense, the spectroscopy or uh, using the solar gravitational, so, uh, so solar gravitational lens will be an, a very impressive contribution. Imaging, optical imaging will come, will come in the optical band and spectroscopy where we are very much interested to, to see for the hydrogen, nitrogen and the methane, uh, those lines that indicate presence of life. We'll get a very good signal noise ratio with the very uh, short integration times. And as we know, uh, James Webb uh, detected broadband spectroscopy looking at the presence of water uh, in, the, uh, in the WASP, uh, the, the planet that was uh, observed by James Webb. It was the first detection of uh, water uh, molecules in the atmosphere of distant exoplanet. But this is broadband spectroscopy uh, using the transit spectroscopy um, uh, for the whole exoplanet. We are talking about resolved spectroscopy per pixel. So now, for example, uh, not only uh, the solar gravitational lens will provide us with imaging, but also spectroscopy. If we know that there is a significant methane emission, 
It may be a farm or maybe a sort of a swamp where methane is emitted, but we can correlate that information now with imaging. And so remember the imaging capability of the solar gravitational lens allow us to think about taking the image of, of exo-Earth at 100 light years away with about 15 miles resolution on its surface. So the image of Los Angeles, for example, can be made with about 40 pixels. And so uh, that means that we can look at the continental lines, weather patterns, topography, ice caps, uh, in using combination of data, imaging and a result spectroscopy. That's why this is a technique that is challenging, but uh, it indicates the capabilities that are within, within reach. Um, and we also realize that the sun is not uh, spherical, completely spherical. There is a, um, a blatantness to it. So the sun rotates, it produce, produces a little, a little small quadrupole moment. And so we now fully understand the contribution of the quadrupole moment and now understand how to remove the quadrupole moment during the imaging. imaging. But it's uh, just for the sake of uh, beautiful contributions. That's what actually quadrupole moment produces instead of a single airy pattern produces such nice caustics, asteroid caustics. And so we now uh, develop technique how to deal with this point spread function that is given in uh, such an asteroid caustics and to be able to actually start, uh, start imaging using these advanced uh, capabilities. Moving on, uh, that is an interesting way just for your background. Uh, what, what you see on the left is the asteroid caustic that is projected uh, if you have a single a uh, single point, a point source. And so the point source is, uh, projects a caustic on the image plane. The crosshair indicates the position of the telescope at any given moment. So that telescope doesn't see Einstein ring completely. What it sees are the four, uh, four bright spots. So this is the Einstein, this is the evolution of the Einstein cross. So, uh, you will see Einstein ring only when the lens is uh, perfectly spherical. If lens has a little ablateness, little, uh, little deviation from the spherical symmetry, you will, you will start seeing this Einstein crosses. And so we are now able to use this Einstein crosses to our benefit and actually to our advantage to be able to remove unwanted blur and to start imaging an exoplanet with high resolution. And so that's again, this is the simulation we have done how to uh, demonstrate a single uh, sort of a single um, point imaging, point source imaging. And this are the uh, amplitudes of um, uh, those Einstein crosses. This is the brightness that we collect on the image sensor. So with these techniques, we are able to recover full image capability. So the, the, uh, we, we have, uh, uh, sim we have uh, simulations confirming uh, the analysis. For example, for the most distant target, let's say at uh, 30, per, uh, 30 per sec away, it's a, a hundred light years away. We can image the exoplanet with exo-Earth. We use exo-Earth for our simulations. We can, we can image exoplanet with 128 by 128 pixels within about four, six months of integration time with a single spacecraft. And if we are looking at the, our neighbors within uh, four to five uh, light years away, we can make images of those exoplanet with thousand by thousand pixels within, within about uh, of five to six weeks. So this is a very short integration time. I'm talking about single spacecraft. So for the nearby targets, let's say up to uh, 10, uh, uh, 10 parsec, I think using small telescopes between the 40 to 80 centimeter telescope, several of those telescopes working in combination, we can, make, we can start making images that will be able to remove the smearing due to diurnal rotation. And so this is quite exciting, but now, uh, this is the objectives, but how to get there? The challenge is that, yeah, I'm, I'm showing the same picture that I started my presentation with. So the solar gravitational lens is right here. It's a 548 astronomical units away. And so it is quite far. It took Voyager to get there with uh, 40 years. Uh, I mean, it, it, uh, it, Voyager uh, flies to 155 astronomical units away. It took it uh, to get there about 40 years, 42 years to be exact. So to get into this region where we would like to operate, we need to go fast, we need to fly fast. And so realistically, we are considering this mission. So it will be um, within the lifetime of a scientist or engineer, right? So it's about, uh, so the mission has to complete within a finite amount of time. So that, uh, that means we need to fly fast. And flying fast implies the velocity of roughly 20 astronomical units away. And just remember Voyager, 
is demonstrated record, a speed record. It's a 3.1 astronomical units per year. So we, we need to be able to reach velocities of roughly 20 astronomical units or higher. Mm -hmm. So solar radiation pressure. Solar radiation pressure is the technique that we, uh, we decided to, uh, to, to, to benefit from. Solar sailing is the technique is actually that which uses solar radiation pressure. And the solar sailing uh, technology that is currently in development and sort of being already demonstrated by a number of missions is, uh, has the promise of providing us with the, 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 with the needed velocities, velocities of 20 to 30 astronomical units per year. So this is why we studied multiple different techniques, how to accelerate our spacecraft to needed velocities. We looked, at, we looked at chemical propulsion. Chemical propulsion, Falcon 9, or even the future generation of Starship, um, we need to go all the way to Jupiter, then uh, using gravitational uh, uh, maneuver around Jupiter, start flying towards the sun and carrying a significant solid uh, rocket booster and the thermal shield and flying by the sun, we perform something called Oberth maneuver, and we will be able to reach velocities of shy of 15 AU per year. So this is not extremely effective. It's doable, but it's not very effective to reach velocities that we wanted to, to have. Then we looked at solar, solar thermal, nuclear electric, all of those technologies, uh, they have significant promise. But um, as uh, people were talking about uh, um, a nuclear fusion technology, uh, for the last, what, 15 years, it always 20 years in the future. So it's a low, a low TRL technology. And unfortunately, we cannot rely on it if you want to go there fast. And so we decided to stay with solar sailing and see what can be done in the next uh, several years. And so what is solar sailing? Solar sailing is actually is a technology that now benefits from three different revolutions that are happening in the space industry. First one is, of course, interplanetary spacecraft, the small ones. Uh, less than 50 kilograms in, in, in total mass. And good example of those spacecraft will be Marco 1 and Marco 2 that were developed at JPL, 6U CubeSat, were flown on inside a mission when inside was landing on the North Pole of, uh, of uh, Mars. So the two Marcos uh, were flying by and taking data and, and, uh, and transmitted data directly down to Earth. So the cost of those missions, uh, I think the Marco 1 cost uh, was $9 million. And the second mark was, I think it was about $3.5 million. The, the total mission cost was about $16 million. So that, that is the cost of the uh, two spacecraft that were flown together with InSight. They provided very incredible capabilities to be able to observe entry, descent, and landing of InSight and uh, in the real time. So this is uh, very good. And so those spacecraft do not require a dedicated launch vehicle that can be launched with the right share capabilities. And so there are plenty of other spacecraft like Neo Scout is now getting ready to be launched with the SLS uh, that is now in the Cape, Can uh, in the Cape, Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy. Uh, it should fly uh, by the end of uh, September. And so Neo Scout is the uh, solar sailing spacecraft that is now sitting on, uh, is, is getting ready to fly. So solar, sail, solar, solar, solar sailing is um, essentially the technology with high potentially with high velocities and zero propellant. Good examples of those technologies, the flown missions Icarus by JAXA, the Japanese space agency, light sail by Planetary Society. And what you see here is essentially the Icarus uh, sailcraft. The side length of that sailcraft was 14 meters. Light sail here is of, uh, almost six meters. Uh, the Nia Scout that is now being ready for, for, for flight is sitting on the, in the fairing of uh, uh, SLS uh, vehicle. The side, the, the side length of that vehicle is 9.2 meters. So, and of course, uh, the development of small nuclear power for distant uh, destinations is, is a key. So this mission needs to be able to get its own board uh, uh, enough power. So power is a key. The two uh, challenging technologies, of course, here for, for a mission like this is the propulsion. We need to fly fast. And we need to have onboard power. So the nuclear power is the key. Um, how solar sailing works? Essentially, it's like a sailboat. Consider a sailboat. You have uh, for, for typical sail, solar sailboat, you have the wind, you have the sail, and you have a rudder. So when the wind is acting on the sail, and you can uh, uh, change the orientation of your rudder, and you, you potentially can form a trajectory almost against the wind. So you can tack against the wind. With solar sailing, you have the same. So you have a solar radiation pressure, you have the sail, and instead of, uh, instead of rudder, you have reaction wheels on board. 
So potentially, when the solar uh, photons impacting the sail, they're transferring momentum, and you can now start uh, using that momentum uh, they, um, and uh, start start moving under the uh, under the light pressure. So there are several of those uh, 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 sailcraft known. Uh, the, the best uh, known sailcraft, of course, um, segmented sailcraft that we that we designed because a, a plane sailcraft, a planar sails are not very a good in uh, uh, changing and uh, not very good for precision navigation, but for the sailcraft, segmented sails allow us to actually change course. So this is the evolution of the sailcraft. We started from uh, Sun uh, Vane's uh, sailcraft designed by Lagarde in 20, uh, 2010. As uh, we developed, explored, developed the segmented uh, sailcraft shown on this picture. And so the segmented sailcraft allows for scalability, for uh, launch, uh, uh, adaptation and essentially it allows for a lot of uh, features and the most important one is articulatable sails, uh, artic articulatable veins allow you to actually change course at will and potentially uh, uh, allow you to navigate your sailcraft as uh, anywhere you want, uh, pretty much against the sun. So this is the trajectory that we uh, developed for the uh, sailcraft. This is uh, uh, this is sort of a functional uh, uh, depiction of the um, of this trajectory. We launch from we launch from the uh, from Earth's orbit essentially with C three zero, so there is no need significant uh, for, for significant kick, and uh, opening the sails, we will start dropping the uh, kin uh, kinetic energy, and essentially potential energy from the sun will start take, uh, to, to taking us in, so it will take us uh, almost uh, seven months to reach solar perihelion. And so we'll go through different uh, checkup phases, go through once we cross the Mercury orbit, we'll start approaching the sun. And essentially, uh, once we're flying around the sun, we open up the sails, we orient them as uh, at, at a no known direction. And then this is where we will pick up the needed velocity. And so the challenge here, of course, to have the sail materials that will survive solar, uh, solar proximity. And so the currently available sail materials allow us to approach the sun at the distance of roughly 0.25 astronomical quarter of an astronomical unit. So the technology, the sail, the sail materials that, that now are being in development will allow us to reach the sun at 25 solar radii and not being burned because those materials are highly reflective, they're not absorptive. And so they will be also able to save the payload that will be stored behind those sails. So the full transition through the solar proximity takes about 20, about 16 hours. So the, the, the most the significant thermal load is about 16 hours when we come to the solar proximity, but then we will be moving quite rapidly and we should be able to protect all the uh, payload uh, from any, uh, from any uh, unwanted thermal uh, degradation. So this is pretty much a notional um, a mission a life, um, a, sort of a, 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 a notional mission, mission uh, uh, for different phases. We launch with uh, using ride share, uh, reaching the uh, high Earth orbit will basically, sp there will be uh, a rendezvous orbit. Then we um, uh, um, uh, open our sails, we'll start dropping towards the sun. And so then by dropping towards the sun, as we're flying by the sun, uh, five of those sail craft will uh, be placed on the trajectory towards the solar gravitational lens. It will take us about 22 years to reach the solar gravitational lens. And once we reach it, we will start all imaging operations. Uh, the challenge there, of course, it's uh, all good. Uh, re in reality, we need to start flying those technologies. We need to demonstrate those technologies in action. And this is why we developed something we uh, call technology demonstration mission. And we went through a, a, a project design review uh, this July, and we're developing this uh, mission to be ready to fly in about uh, 18 months from today. So this uh, vehicle is... Uh, uh, this is, we will be able to achieve uh, transit velocities going by the sun. Transit velocities will be six to eight astronomical units per year, twice that that was achieved by Voyager spacecraft. It's basically uh, reaching a very significant, uh, developing very significant uh, 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 a new area of, in the solar sailing. So because the area to mass ratio is uh, of this vehicle is, is, is very high compared to anything that was developed in the past. And look at the mass of this vehicle. It's only the total mass is roughly six kilograms, so less than six kilograms. And so this is the technology demonstration mission. It's not yet the mission that will fly towards the solar gravitational lens. With this mission, we will be able to demonstrate high uh, survivability, manufacturability, and will be built to cost essentially. So the point here is that no new technology development is needed. The total mission cost for this technology demonstration is about $17 million. 
and it will go from Earth's orbit, will go through, Earth, through solar perihelion, and the mission will fly, uh, as, as, a, as a TDM, it will fly uh, back to uh, asteroid belt pretty much. And this is where we will uh, stop communicating with the mission. And so the idea is that to fly this mission as soon as possible, and then to have series of those missions that will be developing even faster capabilities and uh, doing other things in space. So this is a progression of this design. We started with Sunbrake, a uh, sailcraft, 2016, then went into a, a, a Sunbane design. This is how we started our, our work. And this is what will be flown in the next 18 months. So this is our result of NIAC phase three. This is the sailcraft that is being developed now. So the, the summary here, most of the components are already TRL-9. All this avionics, all the uh, spacecraft systems were flown, except probably the vanes, because vanes were tested in the thermal chamber, but they're not yet uh, flown in space. So the vein, uh, vein structure, uh, the vein approach is uh, uh, TTRL-5. So technology readiness is not fully uh, demonstrated yet, but we will be, we, we will be able to do that uh, soon. So this again this is a trajectory for the, uh, for, for the technology demonstration mission. And that's how we built that TDM. See, we build in the veins. The idea here is that you want to build veins that, are, that will have a very, uh, that, that will have, that will be under tension. Because some spacecraft that are uh, flown recently, they don't have tension in the, sa in, in, in the sail. For us, it's like a Chinese uh, fan. So with, uh, with this type of structure, we are able to articulate the angle of attack of each vein separately, and we will be able to uh, control the thrust vector. That's how we assembled the prototype of that vehicle, one to three prototype. It was assembled last year. And so with this prototype, we now went through full testing of that prototype in vacuum chamber and basically uh, de demonstrating that this vehicle can be built under, uh, under cost, under fixed cost contract. And so that's another picture of that vehicle. So now how, how this vehicle will be able to survive from a loading. So uh, through, uh, we went through different, uh, through, through all thermal analysis of this vehicle, every component, every paint, every, uh, every uh, surface on the vehicle. So what you see here is that the two uh, systems, uh, star tracker and reaction wheels are getting a kind of a significant thermal, a thermal heating. Uh, when they will be at the 2.25 astronomical units away from the sun. But with, this, uh, with the multi-layer insulation that it, uh, with which we uh, performed the treatment uh, allowed us to actually re reduce those thermal pockets. And now the, the full vehicle is capable to survive thermal uh, uh, load at the, at the solar proximity. So this is, again, this is the technology demonstration mission. This is not yet the mission towards the solar gravitational lens. But with this mission, what opens up? So if that mission is successful, and we hope it will be successful, we are now in the fundraising stage where we're raising funding from private donors. We will start demonstrating the uh, fast transit capability flying spacecraft through the solar system. With the first mission that we will fly, we will be able to demonstrate velocities of roughly five to seven astronomical units per year, just to demonstrate that we can do things uh, with this velocity. But now, the next mission will start flying at a faster velocities. We can uh, rendezvous with interstellar asteroids. We can visit Enceladus if you fly with the seven to nine astronomical units per year, and then uh, going to distant uh, planets in the solar system. That opens up a very new paradigm of exploration of solar system, because um, if you are a master student, uh, master student, you are graduating. From, you are graduating from university today. And you would like to fly missions to deep uh, solar system, studying, uh, studying satellites of Saturn, for example. It takes time to develop a successful proposal. It takes time to win that proposal. Usually, uh, I mean, the, the most successful uh, proposals would take about five to 10 years to develop. Then uh, once you get the funding, you start putting your efforts, uh, your team together, and you develop that mission in, in again, maybe 12 to 14 years. So by the time, uh, that launch vehicle carrying your spacecraft will be on a launch pad at, at, uh, at almost quarter of a century past. Then you fly your spacecraft. It takes another 10 years before you get to Pluto, for example. So what I'm saying is that it's very difficult to have uh, such a low cadence because we are very much risk averse because those spacecraft cost a lot of money. So, but we are limited by chemical propulsion. This capability that I described open up a different path. Those mission costs, so the TDM, as I mentioned, $17 million. We look at the mission towards um, 
um, uh, for example, solar polar orbiter, that mission at the level of roughly 50 million dollars. So it's open up, opens up a very different cost paradigm, a very different risk posture, because now we can start flying missions not once every 10 years, and uh, but we can fly several missions a year. The, the point is for the last, what is uh, 50 years, we have flown only six spacecraft beyond the orbit of Jupiter. And that's just not enough. Solar system is big. And if you wait for uh, the, 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 those new capabilities, new, new opportunities, it just takes so long. And usually the cost is getting very expensive, so very high. I think the mission to Uranus now is estimated at the cost of roughly $4 billion. Moving forward, I think it will be even more than that. So it's, um, it's, it's a challenge because we operate in a cost-constrained environment. Any possibility of flying scouting missions in a deep solar system with a solar sailing opens up a very interesting paradigm to bring young generation of researchers into this field. And so what we can do here, so we can do a lot of interest in physics, like with solar sailing, uh, you can uh, change the inclination of your orbit at will. You're not constrained to ecliptic plane. You can start forming orbit to, uh, let's say, a solar polar orbit. You can um, start changing elevation at about uh, 40, uh, at about um, two degrees every 21 days. And so essentially within a year, you're orbiting the sun in the polar, in the polar orbit. And that allows you to study the solar polar regions. Uh, there, is a, there are lots of other interesting topics, and my favorite, would, uh, another one is flying through the plumes of Enceladus with the uh, scouting missions before an orbiter or lander on Enceladus will be developed. We can start uh, studying those plumes of Enceladus within the lifetime of, you know, uh, uh, this generation. It's not passing, it's not passing anything uh, 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 next, but it would be nice if you can start flying those mission, missions in the next five to ten years, because those interesting questions, do we have life in the solar system, will be answered by those probes at a very reasonable cost. So now, I guess uh, the point here is that um, I'm, I'm concluding my presentation. Sorry, it took a lot of time, but basically the current highlights in the near future, we have very strong foundation. We have a very good reason for um, using the solar gravitational lens. It's a major, uh, as a, as a major opportunity to image distant exoplanets with the technologies that we have today. I didn't talk about the technology development, the technology roadmap that we have. Reality is that uh, we have not found any showstopper into looking at the solar gravitational lens mission. We found challenging missions, definitely. It's not, it's not, an, easy, it's not, it's not an easy mission to do. Challenges are good, but in reality, uh, they're all overcome. We need to rely on autonomous spacecraft, we need to develop a mission that will be successful, not within three years, but will, will have to last for at least 35 years. And we need to develop the generation of young researchers that will be able to step in and work on that mission, maybe several of them. And we are not flying just to one particular target. We are flying to a planetary system. So as uh, any planetary spacecraft uh, reaching the orbit of uh, reaching Jupiter or Saturn, those spacecraft didn't study just one uh, satellite of those planets, they studied the whole, uh, uh, the whole system. So with our mission, we'll be studying the entire planetary system of a particular host star. And so if we develop that mission within a reasonable budget, then we will be able to fly several of those missions. And so now the plan, the, our plan is this, we are completing our, uh, our NAYAK phase three. We are graduating from that wonderful kindergarten called NAYAK. And we are embracing the uh, brave new world. We are forming a public-private partnership to start developing technology demonstration missions that will be able to fly, and we call it sun divers. So sun divers are really well received by the science community. We have multiple workshops, and now we will be starting uh, started to build those sailcraft and start flying them soon. So with this, uh, the ever increasing velocities at a reasonable cost. We're talking about significantly less expensive spacecraft than is currently known, we will be able to reach significant uh, technology readiness level. And we hope to start flying that mission to the solar gravitational lens by the time of 2032, 2035. So it gives us another decade for the development and that's what we're aiming. And so by the time I'm hundred years old, I'm a, I'm a man on a, I'm a man on a mission. I wanna see that exoplanet. I wanna see the image of that exoplanet. And people usually say, look, you need to fly faster or live longer. And I prefer that we all do both. Let's fly faster and live longer. 
And so I hope uh, all of you have good health and uh, enjoy life and visiting those wonderful destinations in the solar system and enjoying the parties that we discussed at the beginning. But then ultimately, this is what we cherish. This is our planet. That's what we leave. Let's, let's save the planet. But hopefully we will be able to see similar objects orbiting nearby stars. So this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. Could a Pathfinder mission be done to Jupiter to use that as a gravitational lens? Uh, Jupiter is a good uh, uh, is a good uh, lens, but the challenge is that the gravitational field of that lens is weak. So the focal region of that lens begins at twenty seven hundred astronomical units away. So it's uh, uh, the the something called Schwarzschild radius of that lens is very small. It's about thousand times uh, weaker than the sun. So basically, it's uh, the focal region will be way way too far. So the okay, sun so being be, closer is not an advantage. It's, it's gravity is not strong enough. Exactly, exactly. So the sun is our best chance, and the nature gave us that gift. Let's use it. And think about this. Uh, uh, what is uh, uh, the Dyson sphere? Maybe the Dyson sphere really would have to be built at the, those destinations for the future generations of humanity to be able not only see to see just one uh, one object but maybe seen multiple of those. So building that Dyson sphere, those destinations where solar gravitational uh, lens begins, allows us to image or to communicate with distant worlds out of which are outside our reach with the normal technology. So this is where science fiction begins. But what I, started, what, what I discussed before, it's a solid engineering. And in, in fact, uh, what we have demonstrated, the mission, as I said, is, uh, is challenging, but feasible. Question. Yes. We've seen uh, pictures of the black hole at the center of our galaxy at M82 taken with very long baseline interferometry. Could that be used to take images of extrasolar planets? Is the question, is the question uh, uh, I'm, let me try to understand the question. Uh, okay. Is the question was to use the uh, black hole in the center of the galaxy to image other exoplanets or? Yes. Um, uh, see, the thing here is that uh, for micro lensing, the alignment between the lens, I mean, between the source and the lens and observer is important. I repeat, alignment between the source, lens, and observer. They have to be pretty much nearby, nearby the same line. And so our, our observer must be, uh, must be in the proximity of that line that connects the source and the lens. And so in case of solar gravitational lens, we engineer that alignment by, by deploying spacecraft uh, that, that for, at, that uh, nearby in the, in the vicinity of that focal uh, of the optical axis. In the case of generic microlensing, it's usually alignment is only, only, um, uh, uh, is only temporary. So usually those alignment, those microlensing events they last for about a month. We see how the light is the, of a particular star gets brightened. And so in, in, in about two weeks, and then about two weeks, the alignment is gone. And so basically the star dims again. So uh, we cannot control those alignments that where the lens and the, uh, is not, uh, um, is far away from us. So in case of solar gravity lens, we can control that alignment. And that's, that's the, the, the only way for us to actually benefit from uh, from the lensing in a practical sense. Otherwise, all those micro lensing events that you see, uh, they're either done with galactic with the galaxy as a lens or galactic clusters. And so, when those lenses are at, uh, at those distances from us, they do last long, but uh, they pretty much realized on a human time scales. We see those Einstein rings, but uh, we cannot. It, they pretty much we, we cannot change the orientation of those lenses. Of, the, of the, those images. So with the solar gravitational lens, we can choose the source uh, which we would like to observe and go in opposite direction or from that source and then engineer that alignment to start imaging it. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, what I meant was, could we use the technology that was used to image the black hole at the center of our galaxy to image- Oh, uh, using interferometry. Uh, yeah. using, using interferometry, uh, to make a resolved, uh, we will fly interferometer very soon. It's called LIFE. Uh, LIFE will be uh, developed by European, uh, by our, our European colleagues. LIFE will be able to find exoplanets. 
but it will not be able to image the exoplanets because to image those exoplanets with the, to make a resolved a result image of those exoplanets, you need to have a variable baseline. Not only the baseline must be um, larger than 90 kilometers. Remember, we want to uh, similar, uh, uh, similar to a telescope that which we, we described, uh, taken, the, uh, taken for, for example, exo-Earth 100 light years away. To image that object with one pixel, we need to have 90 kilometers uh, resolution. You, we can make that resolution by flying an interferometer with 30 meter telescopes separated by 90, uh, 90 kilometers. But to, to make an image with the interferometer, we need to have uh, variable baselines, not only baselines, but their orientations. Uh, we need to make something called, uh, to cover something uh, UV plane, like in, in a spatial Fourier domain. And in reality, the 30 centimeter telescopes, they, they must have uh, their star shades and integration time to remove the exozodiacal exo 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 uh, light will be at the millions of years. So with interferometers, sorry for my long answer. Technically, it's a good approach, but it's not really feasible because uh, the um, integration time to make uh, one image will be prohibitively long. Thank you. I have a, I, I have a question. Um, so I, I assume that there, you would only pick one target. Correct. Right. And, and is should that ideally would that target be orbiting its sun perpendicular to the sun to spacecraft vector or in the same plane as it? You know, well, should, should we be looking at it face on or sideways? Uh, realistically, we are orbit agnostic. Okay. So if, if we are, if that, um, if that planet orbits uh, in, uh, um, in, in a plane, we will be able to image that uh, planet, uh, let, let's say three months in the spring, three months in the fall. We will not be able to image it when the summer and, uh, uh, and, and winter because it will be either transiting the host star or will be going behind it. So right. three months in the spring and three months in the, in the fall will be sufficient for us to image it. So of course, if the planet is, uh, is uh, face on, it will be uh, easier to do that. But basically it's, uh, Expect anything that the nature will give us a gift that habitable exoplanet will be exactly face on, which we should not assume that, right? And so, but the technique that we described here, it allows us to cover, to, 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 to image any exoplanet that uh, we will be able to find. The, 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 I guess the main challenge now is to find the exoplanet that deserves our attention. Because uh, in, the, in reality, uh, we have discovered uh, what um, eight uh, eight thousand exoplanets, but none of them resembles our own Earth. So we hope that in the next maybe five to ten years, we should be able to find those targets that will uh, uh, that will um, uh, be a good motivation for us. And so once the target is uh, uh, we found this, the target, then we will fly the mission to the solar gravitational lens because that's the only way for us to image those exciting objects. Thank you. Um, my, my question is, I, I think what I heard was your very audacious uh, uh, plan has also resulted in the creation of a kind of, of uh, spacecraft that is an extremely low cost uh, solar system exploration system that we could launch many, many satellites or many, many probes utilizing this solar sail uh, sun boost mechanism. Is, was that correct? Absolutely correct. And that's the, one of the major outcomes of our effort because we have shown that already with existing technologies, with the sails and avionics that was flown with TRL-9, we can start flying those sail craft within the next 18 months. And that's what we are trying to demonstrate uh, you, um, we're now building the private uh, public uh, partnership where some philanthropic organizations are interested to step in and help us to develop those missions. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. So, so now, uh, light pressure is a very, very weak force. Um, you also have all these particles coming from the sun. Do you utilize any of that particle capture uh, to? be a propulsion force? Uh, 
the photon density that we have in the solar proximity which is much higher than any particle that is uh, being uh, you know in the solar vicinity and besides the solar photons they have very pre precise direction they're pretty much readily out of the sun we can use those photons uh, to navigate uh, the cell craft particles uh, they have uh, a lower density and their, their kinetic energy is less than that that we can demonstrate with the solar uh, with the solar photons. So, so we need a target. At, all right, and uh, so with solar photons, uh, we have uh, with solar ceiling, we looked at uh, multiple ways of benefiting from the solar ceiling. And so the, those uh, solar wind is uh, is not a good uh, is not a good mechanism because it's much weaker. Particles are not, not helping us here. So to benefit from solar sailing, we need to come closer to the sun. And the challenge there is that, of course, we, uh, we need to have something called large area to mass ratio. Uh, area, uh, the total area of the sail divided by the total mass. The larger that factor, the more effective the mechanism of solar momentum transfer to the vehicle. So for that, uh, we, uh, we either need to have very large sail and fly at very safe distance from the sun at like let's say quarter of an AU, or approach the sun to very in, uh, extreme, extreme pro in, uh, proximity. And uh, so we have, uh, we are developing, my, our colleagues in Caltech and UCLA develop materials that, that can survive, uh, so the sail materials that, that, that can survive uh, a 10 solar radii proximity thermally. So we're talking about thousands of degree Kelvin. And so those materials uh, will be available soon. So uh, if we fly around the sun with those distances, and I hope we will be able to do that soon. So then we, 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 we are tapping into a uh, uh, sort of infinite amount of, uh, you know, a propellant essentially within the, within the sun. And so that's what we are planning to do. So I, uh, with solar sails, I guess, the, uh, the materials are being developed. What we need to pay attention to is start to develop the systems. Like, uh, I'm sorry, Mama. Yeah, the, uh, what, we need, what we need to do is to start developing subsyst subsystems on the, on the sail craft, meaning all the instruments, avionics, and uh, small, small, um, um, small components, because all of those components were developed for the lower Earth orbiting uh, spacecraft around, around the Earth. So we need to start building instruments that will be able to survive solar proximity or develop so, uh, thermal shielding, which is lightweight. So there is a lot of efforts going on in the, in the community. We are assembling the community here in the United States and uh, in Europe as well. A lot of interest for the last year and a half, we traveled around the globe, essentially significant cluster of companies in, in Europe. Uh, quite a few companies here in the United States, East Coast, West Coast, uh, Colorado. So we are developing uh, uh, this type of vehicles and we would like to fly them soon. So you need to hit a target one and a half kilometers wide at 600 AU when you can't see the target on the way there. How do you manage that kind of level of accuracy? Amazing, amazing question. Um, um, I don't, I did, didn't go through that in my presentation, but basically um, maybe I should not, should not just uh, let me explain. Solar gravitational lens, the property of the solar gravitational lens uh, allows, uh, allows us to use the host star for navigational purposes because the host star is also amplified, but it is uh, making an image about 100,000 kilometers away from the exoplanet in the image plane. Uh, we can position a spacecraft uh, to track the, uh, uh, the amplified light from the host star. And essentially, uh, that will provide a very good guidance sensor for us. Tracking the position of the host star provides us with the ability to build a local inertial reference frame where we can navigate spacecraft with a meter class precision locally. We don't navigate that spacecraft with respect to the geocentric, uh, uh, heliocentric uh, reference frame. We navigate with respect to local reference frame. And that is uh, done by tra tracking the light from the host star. For that, we need to fly another two small spacecraft that will be dedicated only for, the, uh, for that purpose. Or maybe this five spacecraft that I discussed will be able to essentially um, uh, use the information on the image sensor for that purpose. Here, what I show is that, for example, if the, uh, this is the uh, host star, it's not the sun, it's, it's a host star, just the image of the host star. If uh, the image, if the spacecraft 
is about 15 uh, images of the host star. Uh, if, 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 the, if the spacecraft is far away from the image of the host star, it will see two bright spots. When it comes closer to the host star, it starts developing arcs. When it comes in the image, the arcs are met and almost in a semi uh, closed uh, Einstein ring is formed. That information provides us with a guidance. It's a guidance sensor where this uh, host star is, we can track it and then uh, use the orbital information to actually recover the image position of the, uh, of the exoplanet. And again, to repeat, the acceleration that we need to uh, have, delta V is uh, six micron per second squared. It's not meters per second squared, it's six micron. Still a lot of, still a lot of uh, xenon or maybe uh, you know, iodine propellant that we need to carry, but it's not, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very sort of reasonable uh, delta V amount that we will carry on board of the cell craft. So all of that, all of those um, investigations were done and we concluded that uh, so with the ion propulsion will be sufficient to not only to establish local reference frame, but also follow the image of exoplanet precisely to be able to image it. Thank you. Another question. Absolutely. Uh, I believe I saw in your slides that the, the spacecraft that are going to travel to the focal region, uh, uh, we're going to be, the instrumentation will be battery powered. You wouldn't need to send an RTG out there. No, we'll have to have our, not RTG, but we are looking at RHU, so maybe a new type of uh, thermal nuclear thermal generators that are being developed now at Aerospace Corporation. That's the planar array of uh, sort of uh, when you connect uh, RHUs with a battery, and essentially that planar array uh, will uh, allows us to uh, get a long lasting power. And so we estimated the power that will be available in the spacecraft will be sufficient to drive the telescope and computer. And so with the planar array, I don't have the image of the cell of the spacecraft here, but yes, this is uh, all doable with a small patch like a planar array that is being developed uh, in the community now. And that planar array with the nuclear uh, thermal uh, um, RHU that all, uh, also are sort of connected together with the battery. And those, those arrays, I would say, what about three by eight inch uh, uh, and the thickness about uh, half an inch. And so those arrays, uh, you can put several of them, many of them actually, on the periphery of, this, uh, of, the, of your spacecraft. And uh, that would allow you to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to benefit from this, uh, um, uh, from, um, from this technology. If you allow me, I can show you maybe just very briefly uh, how that, uh, how that uh, uh, spacecraft looks like. Uh, my apologies, I was not planning to show that uh, in the in the talk, but I will just show you an example of uh, so that, yeah that came from um, um, just one second. I'm open I almost open up that paper that is now being reviewed in the Journal of uh, Spacecraft and Rockets, and so here is the okay the image. I will. Uh, stop sharing and I will share, share another screen. And that screen will be, I think it's right here. So what I'm sharing, uh, what I'm showing, this is the uh, hockey pack design for the uh, spacecraft. So the, it shows the primary mirror one meter class and it shows secondary mirror on the, on the, on the right panel. And so uh, those Apple planar arrays are shown here in the green, uh, green packages. So those green uh, pl plates are those uh, uh, arrays. And essentially we also have uh, uh, what's shown here, the thrusters, the thrusters from uh, ion thrusters are placed on the periphery of the, of the spacecraft. And so, but this is something for the solar gravitational lens mission, which we are not flying today, right? So it's something that's an advanced concept. What we will be flying soon is that uh, technology demonstration mission. Now you can think about flying that uh, sail craft in the inner of the solar system. Uh, you can cover the sail surface with photovoltaics and derive power directly from the sun because you have a large collecting area on the sail. You don't have to use the full sail, you can use just part of the sail. In addition, you can use the sail, you can bend the sail so that the sail will assume a parabolic shape. And um, 
uh, with the parabolic shape, you can use that sail for communication purposes as a radio, as RF antenna. So repurposing of the sail provides several benefits. In the inner solar system, we don't need to have our RTGs or RHUs pretty much all the way to the orbit of Jupiter. And so uh, be, beyond that, we may actually need um, uh, those uh, RTGs or RHUs, but within the orbit of Jupiter, within 5 AU, uh, those uh, repurposing of the sail will allow us to uh, derive energy and use it for communication. Ingenious. Hmm. Thank you. That's cool. <laughs> Sorry for the long answer, but it's, it, it's, it's a lot of things being uh, designed here. I didn't show it. Well, sure. so, many, so many fantastic things are having to come together to make this a reality. It's amazing. It's, just... uh, it's, it's, it's really, if this mission happening, and I'm truly, I truly believe it will happen, we are putting a lot of energy, it pushes every piece of the technology that we have developed today. Autonomous uh, uh, operation of spacecraft. We need to cut umbilical because one day uh, light time traveled from Earth to the solar gravitational lens. It's four days. It's four days, uh, one, oh, it's, a, it's a one way through travel time. If we cannot control it with joystick and uh, G, JPL's navigation room, right? So it, it, they have to be autonomous, completely autonomous. So then, uh, you know, so, uh, they have to be, um, uh, be able to diagnose uh, their uh, failures. They have to be able to recover from failures. You have to be able to articulate, uh, you know, veins themselves because when they're flying by, by the sun, that we will not be able to control them, those cell craft, because we cannot point radio antenna at the sun, right? So those cell craft must be autonomous when they go uh, within the six hours approaching the sun. And when, I mean, there is, there is another way to use the cell. Sorry for taking uh, another example. Um, those cell craft that we discuss, they pretty much area to mass ratio has to be large. It's either building very large sail or using small mass. Uh, practical, what is practical today is really masses of the sail craft about 20 kilograms. In the 20 kilograms package, you don't really put a lot of uh, smarts, you don't put a lot of instruments, but what you can do, you start possibly doing in-flight aggregation. Once you accelerate that sail craft to very large, high velocity, and they're already flying at six to 10 astronomical units per year, two or three or five of them will start approaching each other using sails to trim their velocity. When they're in proximity from each other, one of them will drop sail and will dock like a Lego block with the second one. So what is needed is a modularized approach to building a sail craft in space and maybe using magnetics, I guess, magnetic, uh, uh, and then uh, some fasteners, automatic fasteners on the sail craft. You can be able uh, to build a larger system that is capable of uh, mission capable spacecraft that will be actually working autonomously at the deep regions of the solar system. So there is a lot of ways you can actually use this technology and the benefit of the ongoing space exploration efforts. Do you expect the imaging sensors to still be like CCD or CMOS technology? Uh, for now, we are baselining uh, CC, uh, CCMOS technology. Uh, of course, uh, in the future, they will be different. But for now, we're using whatever is uh, possible. Our technology cutoff date is uh, uh, 2028. And so we are baseline in what is developing in the community and especially in the industrial community, uh, sort of in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the commercial in the, in the commercial space. So seeing what is developing there. And so trying to benefit from whatever, uh, you know, CMOS sensors are being uh, developed now. And um, uh, possibly with uh, infrared sensors, this is, if you want to go to near, near IR, that will be a little bit challenging. Uh, because those sensors uh, probably need to have you know to, to be developed uh, separately, but um, it uh, ultimately uh, we would like to have a multi uh, what is a focal plane array which will have uh, different sensors, including optical near uh, near IR and maybe even uh, you know UV sensors. Mm -hmm. So, but that's to be determined uh, once we will start developing the proper mission. My primary objective now is start flying TDMs because once the TDMs are flown, once the high transit velocities are demonstrated, then solar gravity lens as a mission will become a reality. So my, my, my primary objective is to raise technology readiness level for the solar assailant uh, in the next couple of years. Sure. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for enduring such a long talk and my apologies for running that late. Uh, but I hope you got some very interesting what you're doing.
questions. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Goodbye. We'll, we'll be watching your progress. <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. We'll stay in touch. Thank you. Good very much. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. Uh, we're going to try the Crown and Anchor Hub over on San Jacinto. Anybody wants to go over there and uh, have some food and some socializing? Let's do anything else? We're doing yes. Oh, Eric Kelly, steal cards. Right.